Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we will get started here in about four to five minutes. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat while we wait. Um, we're going to give people a few minutes to join us today. Thank you for coming. everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes before we get started here. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Please feel free to introduce yourself and your organization in the chat while we wait just uh, one or two more minutes before getting started for today's webinar. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we can go ahead and get started with um, an introduction while we continue to wait for people um, in the chat. Again, thank you for joining us for today's um, webinar on USAID financial policies, internal controls, and compliance. Just a few quick notes. Um, please continue. I see many of you are already introducing yourselves. Please continue to do that if you haven't already so we can see where people are calling in from. Um, Throughout today's webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them at any time in the Q&A box um, and use the chat box to interact with each other or to answer um, any questions the presenter might ask you. We also will be using um, occasionally the raise hand function. So that um, is on the bottom of your um, screen. Please feel free to participate um, when the presenter asks. Um, the recording for today's presentation, as well as the presentation slides, will be available on the ASAP Resources website. So that's at www.intrahealth.org slash ASAP Resources. Just a brief background on ASAP. Um, 
ASOP's uh, goal is to rapidly prepare local partners to have the capabilities and resources to serve as prime partners for USAID slash PEPFAR programming in compliance with USAID PEPFAR procedures um, for PEPFAR program implementation. Um, so we have two strategic objectives at ASAP. The first is to strengthen local partners to comply with uh, regulations as they transition to receive PEPFAR funding as a USAID prime partner. And the second is to prepare local partners to directly manage, implement, and monitor PEPFAR programming while maintaining consistent PEPFAR program achievement and quality. A few key results from ASAPs 1 and 2. Uh, ASAP has supported 126 local organizations in 18 different countries. 113 have been local partner organizations, while 13 of those have been local government partners. So we've worked across many countries. Um, which are listed here. Um, you can see the, the vast list of countries we've supported, and we see many of you are joining in from those countries. So thank you again for joining us today. ASAP slash USAID has broadcast over 110 webinars for more than 22,000 attendees in over 76 different countries. Um, so thank you for contributing to those numbers. Many of those webinars are available still on the ASAP Resources website. Um, again, that's www.intrahealth.org slash ASAP Resources, and we'll send that link in the chat shortly. Some of our webinars are available in three different languages, and of course, English, as we are presenting today, uh, Portuguese, and French. Um, so not all of our webinars, but many of our webinars are available in those languages. So feel free to look on the ASAP resources page if that is relevant to you. Um, we have one upcoming webinar next week in French for uh, leadership and governance. Um, if you missed that webinar in January, again, that's available on our website for you to watch um, in English. Um, and if you have any colleagues who perhaps would prefer a French webinar, that it will be available next week. Um, there also are a few upcoming webinars that are still in the planning phase, so we don't have dates for those. But if you um, subscribe to our newsletter, um, you'll hear as soon as those dates are available and registration is open, um, those will go out via our newsletter. So I will send that link again shortly in the chat. Today's presenter is Doug Frankie from um, Sustainability Solutions. Uh, Doug has done many webinars for us, and I know many of you are excited to hear about this topic today. Um, Doug was a partner at PwC before founding Sustainability Solutions. Um, he has 42 years of on-the-ground experience with USAID and USG rules. Um, he's a Yellow Book audit expert um, and works with clients uh, and NGOs worldwide. And he is the only peer-reviewed audit firm in Africa. So I'm going to pass it over to Doug and his excellent experience um, as we get started with today's uh, content. Uh, thank you, Melissa. And welcome back, everyone. Let me just go here and do some share slides for us. Let's go here. Yeah, it's going to be quite fun. A lot of information, as Melissa said. And thank you again. Uh, this is going to be jam-packed because there's some massive, significant changes coming that we all need to be aware of. And it's pretty much conceptual with this, you know, financial policies that we're going to talk about here. So uh, let me just say this, although Melissa said these uh, webinars are available afterwards for 30 to many days, uh, this one, I'm, I'm saying specifically, today's 6 March, and it could be outdated as of tomorrow. OK, it literally the, the changes are that big. Uh, I was reviewing some. There's a, you'll hear me talk about this, but there's uh, it, it could change as of tomorrow. And then uh, each agency has 90 days to make the changes. So there's a very good chance in the next couple of months, uh, you your organization is going to have to make some significant uh, modification, which is all for the good, effectively. OK, that's who I am. As Melissa said, I've been around for a while. OK, our job, sustainability solutions, not about me, about us. We are. We exist to help you, to help missions, to help auditors, to help recipients. Okay, and that's pretty much all we do. After those forty years, I've got a little bit of knowledge about how to help you spend the money correctly, pass your audits, and uh, and again, especially manage sub recipients. Okay, so that's what we do. So thanks again to USAID. Thanks again to ASAP, the Intra Health Consortium, for giving us this opportunity. 
Okay, it's a pretty short course today because we have limited time and I only have time to present what I say the highlights. So again, we always start with the USAID puzzle. And Melissa, I think you may have mentioned, I would just like to get a sense of just for, so when I ask like numbers, like what, you know, I'm trying to get a percentage essentially of people, uh, just how many people, please put your hand up, uh, if you can find it on your screen, put hands up so I can get a sense of how many people are online and listening and capable of, of, uh, of working with us here on this discussion. So please put your hand up if you can find it on your, on your there we go. How about a few more? Let's just see that you can find it. And then when I ask, I'm trying to get a percentage. So if I know there's 200 people on and I see 100, I know that's 50%. Okay, just keep your hand up for a bit. Excellent. Okay, great. So we got about 40% are, 42%-ish are, are participating. Okay, so what we do is we start with what I call the USA puzzle. And this is, I mean, all of us have done puzzles before. And, you know, it's a jumble when we come out. And my assumption for you on this course today, even though some of you may have more experience than me, my assumption is that you're not aware of anything related to the U.S. government. Okay, that's got to be the starting point because um, otherwise I may lose you as we go along. So, you know, everything I say, and, and as Melissa said, there is the, please put your questions in the Q&A. Those questions are anonymous. In case you don't, Melissa doesn't say, you know, Peter from Zimbabwe is asking this question or Jane from you know, uh, Gates Foundation or from whatever, from Burma or, or Myanmar. No, we never say which country or which organization or which person. So it's totally anonymous, so don't stress. Every question is a good question. Okay, so we started the puzzle because this might be what your understanding of USAID looks like. And it's brand new and you, you're not aware of anything. And then over time, we start putting the pieces together. Let me get my annotator going again. It's always fun to be able to highlight stuff here. Let's see the little red dot here. And as we know, with any puzzle, the four corners are the four corners. Uh, it's the starting point for USA. I'm going to have a little couple slides here, a couple things here. But conceptually here, you know, you did a proposal to USAID. You had the technical part. You had the financial part. We're going to talk a little bit about this. And then they gave us an award, our notice of award or cooperative agreement. CDC calls it a notice of award, but it is of a cooperative agreement. And with that comes the attachments or the standard provisions. That's what last week's uh, discussions were about the standard provisions. Okay, that's four corners are basically your award. You're going to hear me say a few times today, read your award. Okay, and then we pull together the cost principles and we pull together the standard provisions and we pull all the bits together. And then all that's left outstanding is the A. And that A, of course, would stand for agency, but in our context here, that stands for audit. Okay, because a lot of you are going through your audit sessions right now. We've got a kickoff meeting tomorrow with the USA client and the mission will be participating, and it's audit season, okay? Your goal, IPs, is to pass your audit. Of course, achieve your technical, whether it's HIV AIDS or, or economic development or democracy and governance or you know, uh, agriculture, malaria, all these things. Achieve your goals, but at the end of the day, I want you to pass your audit. Okay, then effectively you're done. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, we're going to talk about relationships, and let me just go to, first of all, the USAID slide, and we're going to talk about these people. Okay, we're going to talk about, and on the next slide, it actually even says who they are, AO, the agreement officer, AOR, agreement officer's representative. Okay, so that's what all these boxes are, and I will go through here. But let's go back to the earlier side. We just talk about, you know, for you to be successful, truly has to do with relationships, and the better relationships you have between the U.S. government and yourself and a prime and a sub. So let's just have a quick hands up here, please. Hands up if you are in a prime sub relationship. You're either a prime with subs or you are a sub with a prime. Please put your hand up, the participants. All right, I'm getting a few here. All right, keep your hand up for a few more seconds. I see the emoji. We love emojis. They're always appreciated. Okay, so it looks like about a third of you are in a prime sub relationship. Okay, so it's incredibly important, and I'll talk more about this going forward. But basically, you, know, you should have continuous communications with yourself and your prime, or yourself and USAID. Okay, and you know we 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 we've, we've trained in within a couple of missions across the world, and it's quite interesting on how much the AORs, Agreement Officers Representatives, really don't engage with you, the recipient or the AOR equivalent at the prime doesn't uh, engage with the sub. 
Okay, that's a problem, guys, because communication is okay, you know, if there's no communication, there can be gray areas. Okay, and gray areas can only hurt the recipient. You can't hurt the prime, can't really hurt the prime, it can't hurt USAID, can't hurt the auditor, it hurts you. Okay, so you don't want any gray areas. You want black and white. You want certainty. And let's talk about how to get that certainty. Okay, now there's USAID and CDC officials. And let me do one more quick one, right? I mean, obviously, a lot of you are USAID, and many of you are PEPFAR, which is HIV AIDS. Let me put your hand up, please, if you are getting funding from CDC as well. Okay, how many of you get funds from Center for Disease Control or Health and Human Services? Okay. Okay, it looks like about 10%. Very good, that's helpful. Okay, so the whole point here is there are roles and responsibilities that the US government people have as well. And you need to understand their rules as well. You need to understand, and there's ways to do this. For USAID, it's called the ADS Automated Directive System 303, just the plain one, not the standard provisions, ADS 303. You can Google these or you can go to usaid.gov and type in in the very good search engine, ADS 303, and you'll get their guidelines. And that's basically the guidelines for the mission and the USA people on how to deal with you implementing partners. Okay, so you may as well know. Now, is that for everyone to know? No, but it's probably for one or two people in your organization whose job is to either your, your maybe chief of party or who's ever dealing with the USAID AOR, Agreement Officers Representative, or the guys who are going to go for more funding. Okay, if you know how USAID works, it's certainly, it's helpful. Okay, but the problem with this, and let me just go to the next slide. The problem with this is what we call informal commitments. And an informal commitment is very dangerous. And that's where UIPs listen to someone who's not authorized to speak on behalf of USAID. Okay, and despite how good or bad the people may be as people, unfortunately, on USAID side, it might frequently be the agreement officer's representative Notice AOR, Agreement Officers Representative, that speaks on behalf of USAID, but they, they have very little authority. Okay, the authority, the bulk of the authority, anything to do with money, anything to do with scope or objective, risks, rests with the AO, the Agreement Officer. Okay, and we've had examples, and in our longer training sessions, we have one actually starting tomorrow, uh, but then we'll do another one in late April or May, you know, the longer 16 hour, this course in 16 hours and, and, and more. But the whole point is, you know, I, I explained where implementing partners and clients that I've had are uh, have lost over a million dollars because they did something they were asked to do by the wrong person. Okay, so make sure you don't have any informal commitments where someone is speaking to you or telling you to do something or asking you to do, and your good intention says yes, we can do that. But unfortunately, unless you get it from the agreement officer in writing you need to be very careful. So that's what an informal commitment is. Okay, and then finally, going back to this third one, there are limits on how demanding the US government can be on an implementing partner. Okay, and they say, you know, some guys may be overzealous and they may say, oh, you know, I want, I want weekly reports or monthly reports. Well, there's rules on that. Okay, there are limitations. And in the guidelines themselves, what we're gonna talk about, uh, you know, it, it says in, in 2 CFR 200-101, agencies must not impose additional or inconsistent standards on their partners, meaning you. Okay, so just again, don't bite the hand that feeds you. But what I'm saying is, is be careful if, if USAID starts asking you for stuff that's not in your award, second time, read your award, then, uh, then they're asking you to do stuff you shouldn't have to do. Okay, so be careful about that. But you know, as you say, you, know, you don't bite the hand that feeds you, but they may be over asking to your detriment. But the bottom line of this rest of this thing is basically, the, the, the reality is that primes can be demanding on their subs because the prime is responsible for all the funds that pass through you to the sub. So if your sub screws up, you're responsible, okay? So many times you will be more demanding, have closer attention, ask for stuff that the sub thinks you're being over overburdensome. You're not, you're protecting themselves. Okay, so we've got here, we've got USAID as the agency, one of 28 agencies. Health and Human Services is the CDC agency, if you will, Department of Labor, Department of State, Department of Justice, Department of Education, DOD, Defense, those are all the agencies or also known as a ministry in many of your countries. And then we have, I have you know, there are more roles, of course, but the four primary ones from a financial management 
and compliance point of view would be the AO. And again, the next slide, that's the agreement officer. He or she has a warrant. And that warrant enables them to bind the U.S. government financially. There is a global shortage of AOs right now. So they're, they're, they're dipping into other agencies to come and do U.S. aid work, which can bring its own challenges. Uh, they're letting local or lo local people like Ethiopians in Ethiopia or South Africans here in South Africa uh, get a limited warrant to be able to bind the U.S. government for small amounts, maybe a million dollars. OK, but all the whole problem is, you know, fewer AOs means more risk because people who are uh, who are binding the U.S. government might not all be perfectly cognizant or understand their bind, you know, their binding rules. OK, so the AO or agreement officer is a very important person. Okay, she or he will have an AOR, Agreement Officer's Representative. Okay, and that person basically has what's called substantial involvement. And she or he will be involved with the prime recipient to help you. Well, there's many things they must do. Okay, and I talk about reading your award. Also, when you get your award, you'll get something called a designation letter that AO designates and delegates authority to the AOR. You need to read that as well. Because that's what that's the authority they're passing down to this guy. Okay, so she or he may be able to do some things, maybe help uh, agree on changing your staff personnel or agreeing certain types of approvals that are necessary. It won't be money, right? It'll be it'll be basically administrative type things. Okay, so you need to know what authority they have. Okay, AOR has substantial involvement in your program. Next, we have the Office of Financial Management, frequently called FMO, the Financial Management Office. That's where the controller sits. She or he may have a deputy controller, depending on how big the mission is. And their team deals with all the financial aspects of you. You'll be applying to them to get your, you know, to, to get your vouchers paid. Uh, they'll be working with organizations to have the pre-award surveys. They'll be working with the auditors on things involved in your entrance and exit conferences for auditing and so forth. Okay, generally very helpful. Okay, and don't be afraid to reach out to them. And finally, we have the Office of Inspector General. And for most of us, I know we have some people from Asia right now, from Thailand and other places, but basically we talk about here the ARO, that's the Africa Regional Office. Okay, those are the guys that are 25 Ks up the road here. Great guys. Unfortunately, Rob Mason's retiring. He's one of the best guys we've ever worked with, uh, but he's got some great support coming up uh, alongside him. Uh, and so we will not hopefully be weak here in the Africa region, also known as the RIG, Regional Inspector General. Okay, so those are your main players. These three, the AO, AOR, and OFM work with partners. The agreement, sorry, the, the RIG or Inspector General doesn't deal with UIPs per se. They deal with the auditors and the missions themselves. Okay, so they don't really have a role for you. That doesn't mean you can't reach out to them, but probably the most questions you'd have for the rig, you could also ask OFM. Okay, USA through the AO gives money to the prime, and then we come down to the sub level. Now, I think about 33% of you said you have a you are a, a, a prime or a sub, so this is quite important. Also, as USA is going to localization right now, this is extremely important because if USA wants to localize and there's a shortage of AOs. Who better to pass down money than a prime recipient? A strong USA prime, they say, great, we got it. Instead of us having an AO issue a separate award, we'll give a prime money and you give a sub award. And then there's no more work additional for the mission themselves, okay? Which is good news. We'll talk more about this coming up here in a few minutes, but it comes with risks. Okay, so a prime likewise has to have someone who serves as the AO agreement officer role. And frequently that might be the chief of party or the finance manager for the organization, but rarely will this person have the same skills that the USAID AO has because it's a full-time job, right? So that's the whole point. Uh, and so it comes with risks very much as well. And I'll talk more about those. And then of course the AOR role, which is the prime who's working with the subs to achieve their goals. Then we'll talk more about the subrecipient management team in a little bit, but those are the team individuals or or uh, or people or a team of people who manage your subrecipients, and that is just so critically important uh, to get that right. And then we have sort of the sub level. We've got the sub L, which I would call a large sub, and that is one that spends currently more than seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in its fiscal year. Is a large sub. They will have to have the audit, the USA Yellow Book audit. It's called. The small sub currently spends less than 750000 
in its fiscal year. Uh, if they're less than 750, they will not need the uh, the audit. Okay, and that's 750 from any U.S. aid source. Okay, uh, and now that threshold is going to be going up to a million when the new rules kick in. Okay, so that's quite important there. Then the site is an example of an organization that probably exists in country, even though it's U.S. based. So I, I know some of you are here from FHI 360. Great, FHI 360 is exists in the states, but you have operations in Mozambique, South Africa, Uganda, you know, many places in the world. So if you're if you're an, an, an intra health care, save the children. It's not just FHI 360, but those organizations we call sites, and they're not audited separately uh, in the field. They are that audit rolls up to the uh, to the uh, the U.S. based audit. Okay, so we could have some questions here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the new guidelines coming in. This is a very busy slide, but what I'll explain here is when the U.S. government in the OOMB, Office of Management and Budget, who created the Uniform Guidance, also known as the UG, UG, Uniform Guidance, they basically got rid of all these old blue and red rules. Those are the CDC and U.S. aid rules and created the green boxes. Subpart C, D, E, and F. Of course, there's an A and a B, but that's not really related to us right now. Subpart C, the 200 section, is the pre-award stuff. So this is what USAID and CDC and any agency must do before they give you the money. Okay, subpart D is for most of where we come into play, post-federal award requirements, or what we need to do. Okay, then subpart E is the cost principles. We've already had a bunch of webinars on that. And again, if you or any of your staff need to learn about this stuff, you'll get our email at the end of, the, of this presentation. But yeah, you're always welcome to our open courses. Uh, and then, of course, subpart F is the audit requirements. And that's beyond this, these discussions right now. OK, so all these green parts are the new one. Now, notice what's in the middle. What's in the middle? Your cooperative agreement. Read it. Fourth time, third or fourth time. Someone who needs to read it. Part of it, everyone needs to read. But you need one person who is OCD, obsessive consult, uh, compulsive, who loves to do's, loves spreadsheets loves tasks, loves deadlines. You need a person like that to go through your award and document everything that you are supposed to do. Okay, I put that in the middle because in theory, not even in theory, let's just let's just assume from an auditor's point of view, if I'm wearing my auditor hat, I'm gonna audit you based on your award. Yes, I know all these rules, right? But you are held, UIPs are held to what's in your award. Yeah, it's called the Bob Strauss rule. Bob Strauss, global guru, more than 40 years of experience, more than 50 actually now. Okay, he called it the four corners concept. Four corners, right? Remember, your award used to come in paper, not digits. And the four corners concept is that for a rule to apply to you, it must be incorporated in the four corners of your award. If it's not in here, it doesn't apply. Okay, even if they thought it would apply, if it's not in your award, it doesn't apply. As an auditor, I can only hold you to your award. Now that's your award and of course the attachment. This is, comes as part of your award, all the standard provisions that we talked about last week. Okay? And of course the cost principles. There's no, there's no uh, unique cost principles. They apply to everything. Okay, so read your award, fifth time. So another way of looking at these boxes is, okay, when they went, when USAID as one of 28 agencies uh, uh, received the uniform guidance to ratify. Uh, they took every agency at that point took one year. It came out on December 26, 2013. By December 19, 2014, every, every agency had ratified the guidance. Okay, so all these red X's and stuff like that are gone now. And the beauty is that now we just have what we call the two CFR 200 or uniform guidance. Okay, CDC doesn't call it that, but it's effectively the same thing. It's also in the code of federal regulations, but they put theirs at this part because that's where HHS has all their regulations. But by and large, it's essentially the same thing. Now, what USAID did, because each agency was able to modify uh, the uniform guidance to its use, they did. And so essentially what USAID did is they created this, this, uh, this document down here. This is what we call the standard provisions for non-US NGOs. So it's called the non-US mandatory standard provisions and required as applicable provisions. So what it is effectively, it's a light version I call of the regulations. 
And mainly it comes out of here, subpart D, the post-federal award requirements. So USAID and all their wisdom, and it's a team in Washington who's feverishly working now to update the new, new, the new version. But the bottom line is uh, most of them come from here. Okay, so again, read your award because in your award, it incorporates all the rules from all these different sections. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the light version that does apply to all of you non-US organizations. For the FHIs of the world, even though you're based overseas, uh, you still apply because you're a US based organization. So that's not a light version. Okay, this is a light version, right? You've got light Coke, you got Coke, you got Coke light. You've got Bud, you got Bud Light, you got Castle, Castle Light, White Cap, ooh, Tusker, Tusker Light, all those light beers, light, light drinks. That's what this is. It's the light standard provisions. Okay, so here's what the Code of Federal Regulations looks like. This is actually the rule set, and you find it at www.ecfr.gov. Okay, and I'm not going to go through it. I, if we had time, we'd click through it, but let's not worry about it. You can find it, ecfr.gov. And eventually you click to two and you click to, uh, to, to the 200 section. And here's what you want to get done. You'll want to get down to chapter two, the OMB budget guidance. Notice 200 through 299. Yeah, that's what we want. Okay, uh, do we have any questions, Melissa? Let's just take a, a quick break here and see any questions you may have, please. Um, yeah, we have one question here um, that uh, is specifically about having a NICRA with USAID, and they also have a CDC award. Do you, Would they also qualify for a NICRA with CDC or some kind of uh, standard rate like that um, for CDC? Would they get both? Can you double dip? Yeah, okay, certainly it wouldn't be double dipping, but it is, uh, it is yes, you have a right to get your, your overhead. Unfortunately, USAID, who is issuing some NICRAs overseas, uh, you know, if you're a U.S.-based organization, you can get a NICRA if you want. Unfortunately, overseas here, uh, uh, the agreement officers are responsible for administering NICRAs, and a lot of them aren't willing to do it. So a few organizations do have NICRAs overseas. We've got uh, in South Africa here, we have Broadreach, Mothers to Mothers, and Right to Care. And one more is getting one that I'm aware of. Uh, up in Af East Africa, we've got Amref that has them. Okay, so in theory, and this is one of the changes that's coming up, I'm going to talk about in the next five minutes. In theory, you CDC should recognize the USAID NICRA, but they're not. Right now, what they're doing is they're either giving you nothing or they're giving you the 8% uh, indirect cost rate, which is inconsistent. And the OMB is not happy about this. And they essentially, what they've said, and you'll see it, they said, if you're an organization and any agencies, not CDC specifically, any agency isn't honoring the rules, you don't go and complain to the agency that's not giving you the rules. You go to the top. You go straight to the OMB, say, here's the situation in our case here. CDC is not allowing us to get the NICRA, which we've earned, and uh, OMB will handle that. Okay? So that's a good question. And I know we don't have a lot of time. There's a whole two-hour course on indirect costs or a one-day course. But uh, yeah, indirect costs are going to be hugely important, and I'll highlight some of those coming up now. Okay, is that it, Melissa? We had one more okay, that just hear. came in. Oh, sorry. Cool. Okay, yeah, go. Just That's one great. more about um, applying for a NICRA in uh, a specific country. What is the application process, or is it automatic? How do you get the NICRA? No, no, you definitely have to apply. So, in, well, I'd say in your digital packs, but... Um, I think most of we might put up all our sustainability stuff on your site, but if you go to, uh, there are, there's a document in uh, USA.gov and just look up indirect cost applications. Okay. And there are, it is uh, IDC or NICRA. You can Google on that or, or just look for it. And there's a process that one goes through, but the bottom line is you need to first, before you go through this whole process, you'd first want to check with your agreement officer in your country. And it doesn't have to be your agreement officer that gives it. It just has to be an agreement officer in your country. Okay. Cause some guys may be new to the new to the AO game, but someone there may be way more, more uh, knowledgeable and competent. So I would ask them to say, dear USAID, we are keen on a, a proposing for an indirect cost rate or a NICRA negotiated indirect cost rate. Uh, if we uh, propose, would you be willing to review it? and give it to us. 
And if they say no, then, um, uh, you know, then you'll know you're probably not going to get denied. Now, what I'm going to say in, in the next couple of slides would, regardless of getting or not getting the NICRA, I think it's going to be important for everyone to understand your indirect cost structure. And that's the first point of a NICRA anyways, understanding your, your structure. Okay, so we'll talk about that. And it may be become mandatory anyways. Okay, anything else there, Melissa? I think a couple more may be coming in. I love the yeah. questions, guys. A couple more have come in. Um, one is about um, localization. Can you, this is an interesting question. Uh, what is sure. the meaning of localization in USA? This is perhaps a little off topic, but um, love to hear your expertise. Uh, what is the meaning of localization for USA specifically um, for local organizations? What does that mean, and what implications does it have? Okay, so in so localization is well, the, the concept is USAID, and this happens every five to ten years. The last one was called USAID Forward, which was about you know, seven to twelve years ago uh, for five year program. But the concept is that USAID is not really going to be effective until the local or local people and local organizations in your country can deal with the aid money. Okay, yes, it's always nice to have the U.S. based organizations come but then it doesn't necessarily sink into the local population and local NGOs. So localization is a push to achieve, what is it? It is, oh, it's a pretty high number. It is, uh, I think it's like 20, no, it's actually higher than that. It's at least, I think 70% of USAID grants and cooperative groups are meant to go through local organizations. Now, what is a local organization? A local organization, this is part of your, uh, your, your standard provisions, a local organization, is an organization that based in that country, 50% of the directors are citizens or permanent residents of that country. And the board, the oversight board is also 50% citizens or permanent residents of the country. So if you're operating in Kenya, you can have a Tanzanian or a Ugandan or you know someone else on your board, but they have to be permanent residents. Okay, that's localization. And the whole point is, you know, once you've localized it, you're, you're building the skills within country, and that should help USA to achieve its goals. Okay, great. Next question. Yeah, the next question is, is there a, a starting minimum percentage when applying for a NICRA? What is the uh, advice or suggestions around where to start for application? Okay, well, I mean, in their cost rate, it, it, but I, I mean, I hate to say it, it is what it is. And it's a, it's a process one goes through and it's one of the more complicated things. So it's not, you know, we can't talk about it in five minutes, but you have to sort of segregate your allowable costs, your good costs into indirect pool and indirect, it's a, it's a, it's a numerator divided by a denominator. And all the indirect goes, cost goes into the indirect cost pool and all your direct allowable costs go into the numerator or the denominator, sorry, the bottom, uh, it's called a direct cost base. And that sort of that this divided by this gives you a percentage, and that effectively is your indirect cost rate. Okay, so let's just say the normal ones for most NGOs in the states are twenty to twenty-three percent. Okay, overseas the people I know would be less than that. They may be anywhere between twelve and eighteen or twenty percent. Okay, so that is really, uh, but it it could be anything. But we're going to talk about the de minimis coming up right now. So hold off your hold off your your questions on indirects because I may answer some of those. Okay, next question, please. Um, oh. Sorry, a couple of things came, came in the way. Um, what are some best practices for RFI around uh, teaming agreements? Okay, so in our, uh, okay, so a request for information, or I don't know if you're talking about a request for proposal, but teaming arrangements are you need to be incredibly careful that you know who you're getting into partnership or bed with, okay? And you should spend time understanding uh, how they operate. If, uh, if you're a sub, especially, because you're under that prime, the sub does not have a relationship with USAID, the prime does. So you need, it's almost like speed dating. I mean, if I were going in a country and we're going to have a new award and there's a couple big primes looking for subs, I would see if it's going to be a good fit. Can we work with you? Are you going to respect us? Are we going to get the work that you say we're going to get? What happens if the funding gets cut? Are we going to still keep our percentage or you know, frequently the subs get cut out? Uh, no, 
you should check the check the references of other of primes who uh, of, of the, your potential prime who've worked with other countries and other organizations. Uh, some primes are known to be less uh, ethical, I would say, than others on prime on being a prime. Okay, so just be very careful. Uh, understand what you're getting into. Have a pre have a have your agreement in writing. Have your proposal agreement in writing which means yes, and also you have to figure out whether you're going to be exclusive or non-exclusive. Okay, generally exclusive relationships are better because you know you're like a marriage, uh, but there could be ways where if you are the only game in town, you're the sub that's got the guy, the footprint, the language, the ability, the technology, if you've got that, many primes may want to have you in their consortium. And at that point, you don't need to be exclusive. Okay, but generally, I think it's better to be exclusive. Okay. I mean, one could go on for, for an hour on that. Unfortunately, this, this course is not about that. Okay, next question. Uh, yeah, there's a, a few about the NIGRA. So if we can maybe want to um, move forward. Yeah, hold, on those, hold on those. Hold on those. I I will. I may get to that coming up now. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Doug. We can, we can continue and save these questions for the next stop. Okay, great. Yeah, there's plenty of questions, guys. I will stay today uh, late if you have questions. Okay, so I'm, as, I'm, as I'm saying, there are changes coming up. Now, these changes were promulgated initially about a year ago. The process started about a year ago. And let me just say this. The uniform guidance was originally meant to be updated every five years. Okay, so it came out effectively 2014. It was modified 2019, 2020. And now it's being modified again. And these are going to be significant changes. Okay, so let me just say that. And I was reading yesterday, uh, I was going through the, the, the global guru on this, Gilbert Tran, who I've worked with, I've met in Washington many years ago, uh, discussing audits overseas. And uh, he, I was reading or watching a presentation yesterday, just looking for more information on these changes at our company. And I'll explain those to you uh, at the end of this discussion here specifically. So here's about 20, 21 probable changes to the UG or uniform guidance, which means these will flow through, most of these will flow through to you as a prime, as a sub, as an auditor, as the US government, they're gonna, they're gonna affect you. Now, the reason for these changes effectively is to make administrative burden less. Okay, now over 99% of the funds that the US government spends are spent in the states for not-for-profits, for universities and educational institutions, for state and local governments, okay, at 50 states and the hundreds of local governments, and the American indigenous people, the American Indians and Eskimos. That's who gets 99.6% of the funds. So when they made these changes, they weren't thinking of us overseas. Okay, They were thinking of how to reduce the burden in the states and some of the other uh, big changes, probably not so much for us, has to do with uh, research. Okay, there's going to be a lot more research done coming up. So if you're a research institution, you're in the pound seats. Okay, so some of these changes are that, uh, as I said earlier, probably the audit, the yellow book audit threshold is going to increase from 750 to a million. Okay, now all of these, when I hear these, I'm hearing administrative burden reduction for the U.S. government. But overseas, all I see is greater risk, more risk. For a prime with a sub, more risk. For the USA mission overseas here in Pretoria or in your country, more risk. Okay, and risk is a challenge. So, you know, if you do nothing IPs, make sure you have your risk. And that's why we talk about the green book just after this, the internal control framework, which I'll talk about after this, this section here. Okay, so the audit threshold goes to a million, more risk, especially the primes of the subs, right? Your subs aren't gonna be audited, but you are still held responsible for those funds. So you better manage those subs. Okay, next, the equipment and supplies is gonna go from uh, five, or sorry, 5,000 to 10,000. So again, that's less stuff that has to be on the, on, on the uh, asset register, but more risk. Okay, now, um, there is right now there are certain types of activities that require prior approval there's 26 items that require prior approval we're going to see throughout this next five minutes 10 of those are going to disappear 
Okay, but now everyone, 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 everyone. What this means now is when you are doing your proposal, you need to be crystal clear. What are we trying to achieve? We're going to have 10,000 people on care and treatment. I'm going to need 10,000 X. I'm going to need 10,000 test kits, 10,000 reagent sets, 10,000 ART uh, you know, doses. You make it quite clear. It's going to, I need this and here's how much it's going to cost. And sort of the implication of this change here, it says pretty much IPs, if you put this in your proposal, then effectively, and, and USAID gives you that money, effectively that has been approved. Okay, now I, I, I still, I, being an auditor and a taxpayer and having done this for 42 years, I'm still gonna be very risk adverse. And I would always be asking my dear future agreement officer, we're highlighting here in an additional column in our, our proposal that uh, this doesn't require specific prior approval in theory based on the new rules, but I'm going to ask for it anyways, okay? Make it easy on USA to know what you're asking for. Okay, this here's a continuation, but they're making it clear. Agencies like USA can uh, apply discretion to subparts A through E to for-profit entities or foreign organizations. That's us, okay? So what's that A through E? That A through E is this stuff, okay? A through E, they can apply discretion. And that's what USA did. They applied discretion. They went through the A through E, but mainly D, and created the light version, which is the non-US standard provisions. Okay, so that's going to be quite important. Uh, let's see, change MTDC from 25 to 50. So that is huge for primes with subs. Currently, primes, you are able to receive your 10% de minimis on top of the 25 we're going to see this de minimis is probably gonna to increase to 15 and that MTDC goes to 50, which means instead of receiving 2,500 on your subs, you're gonna now receive 7,500 on your sub recipients. Okay, so that will be a huge one. Again, benefit to you, uh, more expensive for the US government, but that's what they've agreed to. These are all provisional. I don't, want, I don't have time to explain the process you go through, but. Uh, we are way, at, December 5th was the deadline for making those uh, suggestions. We made certain proposals, just to clarify for us overseas certain things, okay? But it was in theory gonna come out in December and be effective March. Okay, it hasn't come out yet, but assuming it comes out March, it'll be effective April, May, it'll be effective in June. These changes will become effective in June. Okay, this is huge, clarify that you, primes and subs must disclose credible evidence of, law, of of a crime okay or fraud uh, that's wrought with with gray area what is credible evidence okay I always believe guys you know someone comes to you you're the finance manager and someone says I think we have a fraud well that's not credible you send them back say well go find out what it is and come back to me with some paperwork or more information and they come back and say okay it looks like X happened and it looks like something's missing or money's gone that's credible evidence. Okay, and at, at, at your standard provision M26 is currently where USAID says, if we believe there's fraud at the prime level, we must notify the IG in Washington and our agreement officer. If it's prime at the sub level, you must notify still the sub, you're supposed to notify the inspector general in Washington and your prime, the prime AO, the one who gave you the money. Okay, so this all revolves around what's credible, so if I were all of you, I would get some guidance talking to USAID in terms of legally what is deemed credible evidence. Okay, fixed amount subawards, fixed amount awards. It's not supposed to generate a profit, but there, if there is some kind of a surplus, you are still enabled to keep it. That really hasn't changed for us. I don't see that as a change. Okay, that would be in the ADS 303.3.25. Uh, okay, that's where we find our fixed amount subaward information. Okay, the simplified acquisition threshold. Currently, our fixed amount subawards are limited to $250,000 or the SAT that disappears. Now, it's going to be important primes and for USAID missions. Instead of issuing an award or subaward, consider issuing a fixed amount award or subaward. And I will be talking about that in the next few slides. Okay, interest-bearing accounts, I don't see this new to us. There's those four reasons why one does not need an interest-bearing account. 
when you are um, uh, when you're a, a direct recipient on an advanced basis. Uh, this is pretty much just added what we call the Islamic banking option. And um, I think we had that anyways. In the, in the USA guidelines, we had that as a, uh, as a reason why you don't need to earn interest-bearing account. Okay, program income. Our go program income is going to be allowed for closeout costs. Closeout is one of our five hot topics or critical items to understand in our, our, our online courses. Uh, this is very good. And I will say everything to everybody, I'll say to everybody, you must understand how your agreement officer interprets closeout, the process and what costs are going to be allowed. But this is good that program income can be used in certain circumstances for closeout. Okay, now this is here about when we are putting our proposal together and our team primes. It's the question of, you know, when do we need to get approval for our consortium? And generally, you'll get you'll get approval at the very beginning. So we're going to say, great, we're FHI 360, and we're bringing in X and Y and Z organization. And you know, here's what they're going to do as part of our program. You know, that's up front. The technical, right? Prime's going to do this. Sub A is doing this. Sub B is doing this. And you, of course, you incorporate their costs in there. And when USAID approves that consortium, it's done. Uh, the, the the question to be here is when we're doing changes to our consortium what's going to need specific prior proof. Okay, so it gets a bit gray and it depends on what that subrecipient is doing. I mean, you know, you, you know, you don't need approval for your auditors because that's not doing anything programmatic or your IT guys or whatever else, no. But when it starts getting into people who make programmatic decisions, that's when there may be still a requirement to have uh, prior approvals. Okay, as I mentioned, 10 of the items that require prior approval are no longer going to require. And this is a problem. It's a risk. Real property, okay? Certain types of direct costs, entertainment, exchange rates, memberships, participant support costs, and so forth, no longer need specific prior approval in writing from the agreement officer. So again, one more time, I'm saying if we need any of these items or any items per se, explain why we need it programmatically, why do we need it? how much it's going to cost. And down here, I would still add a column, as I say, in our in our technical proposal, our financial proposal, saying, dear AO, as per the new 407, it says I don't need prior approvals, but I'm just highlighting this to you. So they can see. It'll do two things. It'll show the AO that you know what you're talking about and you understand the new rules. Okay. Okay, here's what I said earlier. Some people are saying, unfortunately, you know, right to care, mothers to mothers, they do get funding from CDC, and CDC is not giving them the their NICRA that's already been approved by USAID. Now, if they wish, they can go, they don't have to complain to CDC, they complain to the OMB. And OMB, the whole point of OMB was to make these rules uniform. That's why it's called uniform guidance. And they're getting pretty upset here after 15 years that some agencies are not playing ball, right? They're not getting the message. So they're going to drive home the message a little. Okay, and that's what this next one says. Clarify that all primes, not just, not just other agencies, but primes must accept the NICRA from other organizations. Okay, so FHI has a prime, intra, sorry, a NICRA, IntraHealth has a NICRA, CARE, Save the Children, World Vision, FPD, not FPD, sorry, Right to Care, uh, and those others, Mothers to Mothers, they all have a NICRA. So if you're going to make a an organization part of your consortium and they have a NICRA, you must accept it. You can't beat them down. You can't say, no, it's too high. They, they're, they're, they're like a, a backpack. And my, my, my good friend, Mark Hoffman, as he explains, he's on the, on the contracting side, talks about the NICRA being a backpack. I almost talk like like in-laws, right? If you're married, you have a spouse, their in-laws come with the wife or the husband, right? You can't get rid of them. Likewise here, right? If you've got an organization, you want them, the NICRA comes with them. <laughs> I like the emoji. Okay, this is huge. Possibly raising the minimus from 10 to 15%. This is huge. So when those of you who said about the NICRA and all this, if I were you, I would, I, if I could get the 15% de minimis, okay, which means it's not audited and you don't have to justify it. And if you can get 15%, I think you're done. 
Now, the only question here is in the current version of this that's being debated, and we commented on this because it says, right, you can, the de minimis can be as high as 15%. Now, the problem is that still means it's subject to negotiation. Okay, now, if it is, so hopefully we recommended saying don't make it up to 15% because that's going to bring the burden back that the de minimis was all about, getting rid of the burden just giving you 10% de minimis. So if it stays in up to 15%, then all of you are gonna become indirect cost specialists because it's gonna be back to negotiations and you're gonna say, I need 15 and they're gonna say, prove it. And then you're gonna to have to do the, what we can tell about the cost policy statement and almost like a baby nitro calculation, okay? So if it does that, uh, then the FHIs of the world who I've worked with and it's done great work, uh, I think they have in the past you know, helped organizations understand their their indirect cost structures. And any good prime, you know, worth your weight, who wants to do do the right thing, you should try to work with your subs anyways, even if you're going to give them the 15, but still help them understand their indirect cost structure. Okay, so that's probably, it's in bold here. That could be the biggest thing. Okay, uh, subs have to certify. Oh, this is huge. Oh. I would not, uh, let me put your hand up if any of you are the person at either the sub, or at the sub who, who passes on the voucher up to the prime. Are any of you the finance managers at the sub recipient? Put your hand up if you're the, if you're the sub recipient and you're sending the voucher to the USAID, or not USAID, sorry, to the prime. Okay, a number of you. Okay, that's a huge risk. That what, that's what this one's about. Okay, now you have to certify that the information you're submitting up to the prime is valid. Okay, and with this comes what's called the False Claims Act, and that's huge. That is, there's a couple billion dollars recovered under the False Claims Act, and that means you know individuals are personally liable. So if this comes, it's probably it's going to come in. I mean, these changes are no one's going to comment negatively about this. So you just have to make sure your controls are adequate. That's why we talk about the green book next. Okay, let's not worry about this. I mean, it, it has to do with exchange rates, but you know, overseas, we have no control over exchange rates. So let's not even worry about this. Okay, prior approval for participant support costs, as I said, or selling and marketing. Many of us have participant support costs. The actual definition of this has changed as well. So this is a huge gray area. So if these are you, if you have participant support costs, uh, I would seek clarity from my AO and AO. Okay, just a few more. Uh, this is very important, being able to include closeout costs on termination. As I said earlier, closing out is fraught with, with misunderstandings, gray areas, so this is good. Now for USAID and the other agencies, except for CDC, Health and Human Services, that you have 120 days from the day your project ends, meaning the day the technical part ends, you have now four months, used to be three, four months to close out. Okay? Those costs generally should be allowable. Of course, you have to close out, but that's the gray area. The question is, what's approved? When do I have to charge it? Should I, should I reserve for it? Or should you know? is it going to be allowable? That's why, again, our closeout course is probably pretty helpful. Okay, let's see here. Closeout, again, allows you to charge administrative costs during closeout. That's a good thing. This is more auditing. Let's not worry about this. Auditors, your auditors in Africa or Asia will be doing compliance testing. Let's not worry about that. Uh, under the direct cost allocation method, uh, joint and common costs uh, for IT. Okay, Appendix 4 is the appendix for not-for-profit, uh, how to prepare a nitro. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a primer, if you will. It's just some of the overhead, some, some of the concepts of indirect costs. But that's what that says. IT costs would be deemed... Uh, uh, under the direct cost allocation method. I'm going to talk about that. I, I keep saying a few more slides, but literally when I talk about allocation, I'll talk about that. Okay, so that's just a quick summary. I, let me just go to Q&A quickly now, uh, uh, Melissa, because I think that is um, that would, could have been confusing for a few people. Thank you. Sure, yeah, we have um, several questions here. Um, the, uh, first, let's go back to the top is, um, must NICRA percentages come from USAID or a specific organization, um, that has an existing NICRA 
or can they make use of their own? This is a little bit of a confusing um, question, but um, I think what they're trying to get at is if they already have uh, one organization already has a NICRA from USAID and uh, is looking for one from a different organization, should you use your already existing NICRA as a part of your negotiation for one from a different or funder? Okay, so a indirect cost rate, a NICRA is, although it may be given by USAID, I mean, if you negotiate with your AO in the instance we're talking about, then in theory, health and human services and state and whoever else should accept it than the US government. Um, that indirect cost rate is, is your entire operation. So that's one thing. Although USAID may negotiate it, it incorporates all the work you do for Gates, Global, EU, whatever else. All those good, all those, those spent funds get incorporated into your overhead rate. So it's an organizational rate. Okay, so for an organization, for, for you, for any organization to use a rate or that rate, their funds had to be incorporated into the calculation. Okay, so FHI 360 will have a rate based in the states, and pretty much it may have a specific, uh, a, a unique rate for something happening in Mozambique or Afghanistan or, or here in South Africa, but pretty much the rate for the organization is the rate. Their subrecipient would come with a totally separate rate. Okay, they would have to possibly calculate that subrecipient rate. So, no, a prime's rate has nothing to do with the sub's rate uh, or any other organization's rate. You don't borrow, you don't loan, you don't, you know, I mean, a NICRA is a specific organizational annual process. Good question. Okay. Another question here about indirect costs. Um, what would you do if your indirect cost uh, was only 8% of uh, the MTDC, but we use 10% de minimis in the agreement? Well, how do you um, account for the discrepancy? Um. Well, if your actual indirect costs were only 8%, well, first of all, you may know that, but for USAID, you get the de minimis. And I say you get it, you have to, you, you effectively, you request it and they have to give it to you. And a prime must give it to a sub as well. Okay, there's no negotiation. It's, a, it's an election, it's called. If you elect for the 10% de minimis, you get it. Now, your indirects may actually be less than that, although it would be pretty tough for your indirects. And we'll talk about that again in a few more slides here under allocability. So it's highly unlikely. Uh, and especially if we go to the 15, I think game over. You know, I don't think any organization, I wouldn't waste time uh, trying to calculate a NICRA and negotiating for it. And a NICRA is auditable. I mean, 15% is a whopping great amount. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be worrying about that. Now, again, if you want less, you don't have to take the 10%, but primes are not allowed, nor are agencies allowed to what I call beat down or say to an organization, no, uh, you know, we think you only need 6% or whatever else. They're not allowed to do that. Okay. And that's in the, it's called the COFAR, Council on Financial Reform Assistance, Financial Reform Assistance, uh, Questions and Answers from October, 2017. Yeah, we can send those to anyone if they want to. Good question. Next question, please. We have a couple questions on um, if the changes to uh, the NICRA and, and other uh, changes are um, applied to existing contracts. Are they retroactive? Are they applied re retroactively? Um, more specifically, one uh, participant asks, um, about subs using, um, having, uh, 25, uh, if, if funds are, are recovered, essentially, if retroactively based on changes. Okay. Can you see my slide? I've changed it now. Can you see this? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this, I found this yesterday. And so this is the answer to many of your questions. So, uh, originally this, 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 this is Gil Tran up here in the corner. He's a global guru. Uh, he now moved to an organization called Attain. Uh, he got poached basically out of the OMB. But uh, as I said, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Federal Register, which is a U.S. government newspaper, uh, published the, these changes that were anticipated. And then we had until December 4th, so December 5th, that, that was closed to provide comments, okay? The 60-day period. 
And now they were thinking th these things would become final by December. Basically, that month they were going to be final. Okay, well, they're not final yet. So that means they're, they're considering these for quite a long time now. But the bottom line is I'm expecting to come out now in March. And then there's 90 days, as I said, for these things to become effective. Okay, which is sort of just to say, you know, what we're talking about now will be in place before your next project. Now, when does it become effective? Okay, be effective 90 days after the issuance. So when the new awards after that. So let's say, let's say, let's say for discussion, March 15th, uh, they put out the fund. Okay, that'll be put into the federal register. And then basically it's March 15th, April, May, June 15th. Any new awards after that, all these rules will become effective. Okay. Now they weren't thinking about it. Unfortunately, literally in this discussion, uh, the question of de minimis came up, but the, the 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 person moderating didn't understand de minimis, so they didn't ask that question. But the bottom line that you're probably asking is, you know, MTDC is going to change. Uh, when are you, when do these 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 items that have to do with indirect costs going to change? Effectively, they say in the next proposal period. Okay. So it probably means also the award starting after that date or the next period. So all of you now, I would say, would be uh, starting to understand these rules. And, and certainly your finance team and your technical team, everyone, I mean, not everyone, but anyone having to do with money should be aware of these, okay? So just take a picture of that if you are, if anyone ever asks you, uh, you know, what, when is this all gonna take place? And there's your answer right now. Okay, I'm gonna go back and share my other stuff now. Okay, uh, next question, please. Yeah, the next couple of questions are about um, allowable costs. So it says, while completing the MT MDTC, um, equipment is a disallowed cost. Do, do you use the USAID equipment threshold or the partner threshold, um, especially when one is lower than the other? Okay. And so this actually becomes even more relevant as equipment's bumping up to 10,000. So the rule is you can use 10,000. You, you, I mean, you can't have a, a let of, of, of higher than that. So you know, your, your FHIs and intra-healths of the world tend to use the higher number because that means you, you need to put less stuff in your fixed asset register. Okay. Now, most organizations capitalize their equipment at something like five hundred dollars, or a thousand dollars, or twelve, fifteen hundred. So, if you use that lower threshold for your organization, that's the threshold you must use to calculate MTDC. Okay. So, yes, manipulating. But I mean, think about it. I, I say manipulating, but um, you know, massaging your policies to maximize your MTDC or maximize your recovery is really, uh, you know, splitting hairs. Uh, but yeah, th that is the rule. If you're thinking it for that reason, uh, you know, if you put, if you classify equipment as uh, $1,000, then that, it, that does get excluded from your MTDC base. Okay, now remember that MTDC base is going up to, probably going up to 15%. So, you know, you recover it that way anyways. Okay, good question. And that's very strategic. Next question. Um, the next is about um, for recipients spending less than um, one million U.S. dollars in a year, um, wishing yeah. to audit their project. Are these audit fees allowable? Uh, no, okay. audit fees like right now, audit fees less than uh, uh, in fact, it's specifically not allowable. So that is if you go to two CFR two hundred four two five four hundred twenty five. It says there in section A. It says you made audit fees for audit audit fees for auditing under the threshold are specifically not allowed. Okay, so you get the red card for that one. So no, so that's why again. So let's think about this. What does it mean? What does it mean? Let me just go back a couple slides here. To me, it means when I go here. Okay, this group here, the sub recipient management team, their role becomes so much more important. Okay, your primes, you are held responsible for the funds that go through. Yet yeah, these small subs are not going to be audited. So as a prime, say I'm say sustainability is auditing you. You're the prime. Okay. I can't audit the sub. They're not supposed to be audited. If I'm the prime's auditor, I'm auditing you, saying, did you manage these subs correctly? 
Now, I'm going to ask you to get those subs, get from those subs some records. I want to see some timesheets. I want to see some procurement records. I want to see some stuff, what they did. I want to see their fixed asset register to see if you've managed them correctly. So that's why, again, that's why Primes, you have more authority to be more demanding, I say, to be harder on a sub than USAID can be on you because you're at risk. Okay, and there's a whole discussion on subrecipient management. Again, that's in our 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 uh, you know five most critical day course. Uh, and if you're interested in that, again, just look at our email at the end of this award at the end of this presentation. Thank you. Next question. Good question. Thank you. Yes, final the question next, for now. Yeah, this is the final question. Um, moving back to uh, the NICRA. What recourse would an organization have against a funder that chose not to implement the approved NICRA given by USAID? Okay, well, yeah, that is, um, that's exactly, the, that's a perfect question because let's just go, that's what they're saying here. Um, let's go here. Okay, clarify recipients and subs may notify OMB of any disputes with regards to an agency, e.g. CDC, not accepting a USAID NICRA, okay? That's, this is what I said here. So if I were one of those four organizations that I mentioned, without mentioning them again, but I would say your CDC is not recognizing your NICRA, they're giving you the 8%, they're forcing you to direct cost stops. When these new rules kick in, I would, I would go straight to the OMB and say, OMB, CDC is not playing by the rules. And they, in theory, would, would make them play by the rules. Okay, let's carry on now with this. These are great questions, but I do need to move on a bit. Okay, so I talked, so there's, there's a concept of must versus should. And where this is, it's in the Code of Federal Regulations at section 101. And it's, it, it says in there, it, it, again, if, if you weren't here, you wouldn't understand this. But where it says must, the expectation from the OMB and from USAID is you must do what this says. Okay, there's a must, shall, should, may. Okay, that's that's the order of that. I wanted to just talk about the musts and the shoulds. So the must is it's called is, is a mandatory requirement. Now there's 884 musts in the uniform guidance itself, but let's not worry about that. Let's worry about our standard provisions, right? The attachment to your USAID awards. There's 315 musts and 38 must nots which is just as strong. You must not do something. So that's you know, it's a, the opposite of a must. Now, as an auditor, am I going to audit you on these 330 Xs? No. It's your job to do them. But the reason I may not be auditing you for all of these is because I'm, as an auditor, I'm looking at which of these non-compliance items could have a material or significant effect on your income statement or what's known as a CIFA, a Schedule of Expenditure of Federal Award. Okay, now for our clients, I'm gonna give you a list of all the things you should be doing, sorry, you must be doing. And I may ask you, how are you doing these? Okay, and you're gonna say, I don't, I don't, I don't, I will, I used to, but you know the important ones, the 30 or 40 that could have a material financial impact, you better be doing those, okay? That's what we auditors are going to audit, the stuff that could put you at financial risk. Okay, but just be aware, okay, in the new guidelines, again, let's just go back a couple slides here. These are changing. The subpart D is changing significantly. I think it was like 38% or something like that. A very significant number of rules here are going to change. And so when this changes, there's a lady in Washington called Dorothea and Francesco. They're hard at work changing this document to bring it up to date. And as I said, they have 90 days from the day that implement the, uh, uh, the, the federal rule changes to get this new uh, the standard provisions out, this non-U.S. standard provisions. Okay, so let's just carry on. So where am I? Okay, I've talked about those. So again, look for the musts. Have your, o have your, your OCD person uh, take your award and search for musts. And there will be about 370 or 80 in there. Okay, and then you you put them in order and make sure your finance team uh, does the important ones. When I say does the important ones, complies with those musts. Okay, your cooperative agreement, this document here comes with a certain structure, schedule A, B, C, D, E. 
and F or E. Let's worry about, all, let's not worry about any of these. Let's just realize that attachment A is the most important section. So this attachment A is known as the schedule, okay? The attachment A or appendix A, depending on what they call it. Attachment C here was your standard provisions for non-US organizations, okay? So that's what you're complying with as well. So in your agreement here, what are you complying with? Whatever in the schedule A says for attachment A, and down here you'll see under 16, the standard, standard mandatory provisions. Okay, read your award, six time now, read your award. And everyone in the in the age, everyone in the NGO should read this section. It's only gonna be 12, 15 pages, but this is where the agreement officer has stamped her or his authority over you to say, this is what you must do. Okay, so read these. It says you when we're reporting and monitoring a huge section. When do we have to have financial reports and our M&E reports? Are they quarterly, semi-annual? I want an annual report. What's the deadlines? All of these are very important busts. Okay, and then it goes on to say, how about our indirect cost rate? Do I get the de minimis? Uh, hopefully 15% now or what? Yes, you have a NICRA. Uh, please use your NICRA or whatever else we have. Okay. Where can I buy stuff from, geographic codes and so forth? How do I treat my cost sharing? Is it additive method or deductive? How do I train, how do I treat program income? Is it the is it the additive method, the deductive method, or what? So this is all the stuff everyone must read. That's what the standard provisions look like. I think that's what we talked about last week. Okay, it gets updated every now and then. This is what, again, your OCD person should read this along with your chief of party and the whole finance team. Okay, so again, we're, we just briefly talked about the rules. You need to understand them because you are IPs, you're administrating it. The auditors need to read it again, as, as they do, because they're auditing you against these rules. Okay, and then one of the beautiful parts of this now is that when they are, they, when the USAID or any agency is considering you for future programs, they have to do what's called a pre-award survey. And there, what, well, there's two things. There's a risk assessment and a, 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 it's the opposite of a risk. Basically, it's a, it's the good parts about you. It's the good parts, which means we've got the best team, chief of party, footprint, language ability, uh, acceptance by government, uh, ability to work in the, in, in, in that area. That's your merit proposal. Okay. The one I worry more about is your risk proposal. Okay. Are you at risk? And that's when we did the subrecipient management course, we spent a lot of time explaining that. Okay. So again, comply with the rules in your merit award. You're going to say you're going to rate highly and that will positively affect your ability to win funds, new funds. Okay. So just briefly here, are you ready to be a U.S. government partner? We use a track and field analogy. Well, the first level is a fixed amount award or a fixed amount sub award. Now, fixed amount award is a beautiful uh, a mechanism because it is the, the is the most basic mechanism that the U.S. government can give you, even if they're starting you down the path of compliance to be a, a, a sub or a prime or even a prime with a sub. Okay, this is very structured. It's three years in length. Okay, they're limited to three years, but there's no limit to how many fixed amount awards or sub awards you could have. So that's not really a limit. Okay, they are based on milestones. You get paid based on delivery. It's almost like a contract. Okay, so upfront, all the work is done upfront. Okay, now upfront, the cost principles are considered, but then they're discarded. Okay, when I say discarded, you are this a fixed amount award or sub award is never audited. Okay, you're just paid to deliver a milestone or a deliverable. So this is quite nice when you're demanding some sort of monthly a report or something like that, why have a whole sub-award or an award when all the headaches and, and administrative that comes with it uh, is a burden, okay? So that's why I said they've done away with the fixed amount sub-award being limited to $250,000, okay, the simplified acquisition threshold. So please, all primes, before you give a sub-award, consider giving a fixed amount sub-award, okay? That's the grade school version of it. Okay, not audited, you, and the cost principles don't apply, okay, and you're paid based on milestones. And even, even though it's not designed to have a profit, of course, you're designed to break even. If there is a surplus at the end of this, you get to keep it. 
Then we have the subrecipient level. Okay, a little bit more, and many of you are subs. Let me just please do me a favor. Put your hand up if you are a subrecipient. Okay, just put your hand up if you're a subrecipient right now. Okay, let's see what we got. A few more. Any subs? Okay, so a subrecipient is um, you know probably the the the, the uh, level to what many of you are. And again, USAID is that's part of this localization. They are trying to make many subrecipients prime recipients. Okay, now a subrecipient. Uh, the thing is, again, if you're if you're over the threshold, you will be audited, which is a risk. Uh, the cost principles do apply to you. The standard provisions do apply to you, but. One of the big benefits in theory is that you do not have to work with the U.S. government. Okay, Now, that could be a good or a bad thing. You, know, you may want exposure to U.S. aid in this case, but you're not going to get it. U.S. aid will only deal with the prime recipient. Okay, So in that sense, I guess it's a benefit. You can get your feet and you can learn how to deal with all the U.S. government rules and regulations without incurring the wrath of an AO or an AOR uh in, in in that relationship with the prime so you have a relationship with the prime okay a prime recipient without subrecipients this is frequently the end state for organizations you've probably worked your way from being a sub and we're a prime after many years and and this is what usa is trying to get to through localization okay so that's great okay you're subject to an audit and chances are you will probably uh and everything cost principles apply you have a relationship with USAID, you're subject to all the risks, and that is at what we call the collegiate level or university level. And then finally, we talk about primes with subs. And this is what we'd say the Olympic or international level. And be careful trying to get to this level until you're really good at this level, okay? Because really, this comes with all the risks of being a prime without a sub, Yet you've got all those subs under you who could be failing, who could be passing up to you fictitious vouchers, and you hold the bag. Okay, You are prime, right? Your subs get audited by probably an independent auditor. If those auditors find fault with your sub, chances are if you can't recover it, those question costs from the sub, you are going to pay. Okay, That's why I said earlier, I talked about that, that, uh, that a subrecipient passing costs up to the prime they have to certify that those are good. But that, that wouldn't give me a lot of comfort. I'm not going to go back to that slide with the boxes. But again, your subrecipient management team better be, better be adequately funded and operating as they truly manage these subs. Okay, so what's the goal? Okay, that's Hussein Bolt, fastest man alive, fastest human alive, right? What's the goal? The goal isn't to win. The goal is to finish. Okay, the goal for you, these guys are all winners. They're going to finish, maybe a you know, tenth of a second behind, but they're going to they're going to they're going to finish. They're going to pass their audit, and hopefully you will as well. And that's effectively the goal. So it's like you know the old shampoo bottles: wash, rinse, repeat. Okay, get the money, spend it well, achieve your goals, get more money. Okay, that is that. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through the cost principles. I'm just saying here, and again, these are all excerpts from our, our, our normal course. But, and again, thanks to USAID and, and IntraHealth for giving us this opportunity. These were the old cost principles that applied to you. Most of you would have used the A122 NGOs. Well, all of those have now been consolidated into subpart E, which is our cost principle. Okay. There are no light version. There is no light version of the cost principle. The cost principles apply here in your country and in the US. Okay, there's no light version. Everyone plays by the same cost principles. And the beauty of this is that US government and USAID says that the federal government or USAID will bear its fair share of the costs that you need to incur to operate your organization. Fair share but they're not going to pay an unfair share. And that's where allocation comes in. Okay, so we're almost done with this first set of slides here. And let's just say there's reasonable, allocable, allowable, and supported. As an auditor, this is what we test of your expenses. So let's quickly go through those. Reasonableness is known as the prudent person rule. Okay, so we as auditors have to determine that you spent the money wisely and correctly. And 
under reasonableness. Okay, so it says a cost is reasonable if its nature of a or amount doesn't exceed that which would be incurred by a prudent person under the circumstances prevailing at the time they made the decision to incur that cost. The prudent person are the operative words of this, this concept. Okay, the concept here is that we are all prudent with our own money, right? You got paid last week. That's your money. You're careful with that. It goes to rent, food, school fees, insurance, whatever, you know, petrol, all that stuff. That's, that's our money. We are careful with our own money. What the U.S. government says is please be as careful with our money, our U.S. aid money, as you are with your own money, and that we will deem reasonable. Okay, a few other concepts here. Did you need to incur that cost to be in operation? So here, when you're doing your justification, I need uh, data for our data gatherers out in the field. I need insurance for the vehicles. I need whatever, right? Show why you are achieving the, how you're gonna achieve the goals in your, in your program description, and then cost those out down here in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, the cost section, okay? Uh, as I mentioned, there's no local, there's no foreign version. So there are frequently in these cost principles, things that might be look funny to you because it relates to certain state laws or things like that. And you're saying, what does this have to do with us? We're in Zanzibar or we're in, you know, Vietnam. They're global. Cost principles are global. So just ignore things that refer to states and local governments. Okay. U.S. government loves competition. So we auditors are going to be look, and, and again, last week we talked about procurement. So if you want to revisit procurement, go back to last week. But the bottom line is part of your procurement should be trying to get the best price. And that means competition. Okay, so we talked quite a bit about that in our last week. So please go look at that one. And the rest of these, let's not worry about these for right now. So that's reasonable. Allocable, this is the most important cost principle of all. Okay, if you get this right, you should recover all your costs. If you get it wrong, you won't. And too few of you get this right, okay? And if, as I said, if this de minimis thing sticks as it is now worded, okay? Organizations can get up to 15%, then this jumps in. This, this concept jumps in, allocability, meaning how much of my cost can I allocate to any specific project or, or program, or basically it's called a cost objective. So your programs, each program is its own cost objective. Okay, so 405A has one, two, and three. And I'm literally on the next page, I'm going to show you these, but I'm gonna leave, this is literally out of the federal guidance, but let's talk about it conceptually first, okay? So the whole point is all of the costs that you incur to be in business can be charged in some way to the U.S. government. Okay, now I want to see as an auditor consistent treatment. Two types of consistent treatment. One, period to period or year to year. And two, program to program. I want to see you allocating costs fairly between your USA projects, your CDC projects, your Gates, Global, EU, whoever else funds you, Danita, CETA, uh, all of those people should get their fair share of the cost. Okay. Now there's three types of costs. One's incurred specifically for the award. Now this is getting a little bit too small, so I'm not gonna, but this is, this is literally out of it. And when I talk about these second two, I'll come back to it. Okay, so these are easy. These are what we would call your direct costs. This is what Bob Strauss, and let me just put in a punt here for Bob Strauss. Bob puts out a newsletter every month, about 60 or 70 pages of absolutely critical information. Okay, and you would get that at his website, go to it or send him an email. It's at Strauss, S-T-R-O-S-S, -S, at Robert Strauss Chartered. You can spell that out, Robert Strauss Chartered, T-R-E-D, Chartered, dot net. Okay, I'd go to Bob saying, Bob, we're interested in your newsletter and deal with them there. Okay, but what I'm saying, Bob calls this the but for concept. Okay, and the but for concept says, but for or except for this award, I would not have incurred this cost. Okay, so those are easy. I got I got ten thousand orphans. I need ten thousand beds or bed nets or you know whatever each school packs for the kids. I'm gonna do I'm gonna do a, a million tests for HIV/AIDS. I need a million test kits. 
Okay, the only reason I'm buying beds or test kits is for this specific project. Those are direct costs, easy. Okay, the next one is costs that benefit both the award we're talking about, your award and other awards of the organization. And the, the, the point here is though, they, that, 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 that cost can be distributed in some logical, reasonable basis. So the example we use here is rent. So for example, you've got multiple projects. You've got your ground floor project and your upstairs project, right? Same space. You got hundred square meters downstairs and upstairs. And the rent check comes in. Say, so Doug, you owe a thousand X pounds, euros, dollars for month, this month's rent. How do you allocate that? Well, downstairs is hundred square meters, upstairs hundred, I'm gonna split it 50-50. Okay, the concept here is there's a proportional, probably calculable mathematical basis to calculate rent or other things, other expenses such as uh, IT, other expenses such as human resources department, or how about the finance department? Those sort of things which have a logical basis and those are called your factors. What factor are you distributing those costs on? That is the second type of allocability. The third type is where most of you miss and USAID, I hate to say, doesn't shine the spotlight on this that you can recover these costs. So the concept is any cost that you must incur to operate, U.S. government will pick up its fair share of it. Okay, so this is where your board, this is where your internal audit department, this is where your internal control risk reviews come in. This is where, it, I mean, before USAID gives you the money, they perform or they'll have local auditors perform that new pass the non-US pre-award survey. We did 60 of them under this great InterHealth project over the last few years, where we go in for missions and assess the risk, assess whether you are ready to be a US government partner. Okay, it's a requirement. USAID has to do that. Okay, and a prime has to do that for your subs. Okay, so if they're, and, and, and one of the big things about this NUPIS is the first two sections or domains says, is the, is the organization structured correctly in the country? Are they paying VAT? Do they have a board? Is the board operating? Do they keep minutes? Do they have an internal control structure? Those are, they're asking us to assess you whether you have these. So if they're making sure you have them, then they're gonna pay pay for them. And so USA says, oh, we don't pay for that. CDC is famous for saying, we don't pay for that. Okay? They do pay for it. You just have to know how to ask for it. So that's this next slide here. When you're doing your proposal, best advice I can give you, Okay, when you're doing your proposal, you highlight as per 200-405. Now, now, for CDC, this would be 45 CFR 75, but still 405. You point out specifically for each item you are proposing for, you say, is this cost is either a direct cost, two, it's like the rent, it benefits both this one award and the other ones based on what basis, rent based on square feet or meters, uh, HR based on headcount per project or whatever else. It's the third one that you are missing. Now, notice what it says. It's, it's necessary for the overall operation of the organization. Okay. The problem is there's no basis for assigning the board. There's no basis for assigning internal controls, logical basis. There's no mathematical calculation. Okay. So earlier I talked about that direct cost allocation principle. And that's what this was saying. I don't want to get too, I'm not going to go back. But this is what you would be putting in your proposal. I would be referencing 200.405D, saying, dear USA, dear CDC, I am incurring this cost as per this B. So that's what the yellow says. It goes along with this up here. Of cost benefits two or more projects in proportions that can be determined without undue effort. Space, headcount. Finance, uh, you know, running through the organization, the size of the projects, uh, what we're insuring based on insurable assets, all that stuff is calculable. That's this one. The next one, the blue one, is where that's I'm, I'm suggesting you you highlight this. Cost benefits two or more projects in proportions that can't be determined logically because there's no relationship between the board and a specific project. The board manages all the projects. The lawyer manages all the projects. The internal control function serves all the projects. Okay, so what basis do we use? It's gotta be some reasonable documented basis. And we've always recommended, what's the size of your project? 
Okay, if this project in our example downstairs, it's a $5 million a year project. And upstairs is a Gates Foundation. It's a $2 million project. Allocate those costs five to two. Okay, and they will accept them. You would say CDC can't say, no, we don't pay for that. Or they can't say well, it could that we could discuss for hours whether their 8% indirect costs could be could be uh, used for that. Uh, you could, but the bottom line is for USA, most of us, we're, we're focusing on USA today. You should be direct costing all of those costs. And they can't say to you, that's what the de minimis is for, because that's not what the de minimis is for. You could use it for that, but you don't have to. Okay, You have the option. The de minimis is not audited, and you don't have to justify the de minimis. Okay, finally, allocability. And so basically, uh, make sure, as I said, every organization is going to pick up its fair share. So the Gates Foundation, Global Fund, anyone we're, we're, we're managing has to get their share of the overheads as well. You can't say USAID is going to pick it up because they're not. Okay, finally, allowability. Uh, the reason we start talking, you haven't, you maybe haven't noticed, but I started with 404, 405, and now I go back to 403. Why didn't I go in order? Well, because for costs to be allowable, they first have to be reasonable and allocable. Okay, so I covered those first. Reasonable, allocable, they could be allowable. They have to conform to exclusions set forth in the principles. As I said, there's some limitations in there, so read the cost principles. And I want to see consistency between policies and procedures, as I've said, that apply to our USA project and the CDC project and the Global Fund and the EU project right? Consistent treatment of how we allocate costs. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. It could be determined in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles or the international standards. So all of you that are under IFRS or international standards or your specific country standards, that's fine. Uh, let's not worry about uh, cost share. And then finally, documentation. I said reasonable, allocable, allowable, supported, or documented. Okay, as an auditor, if I don't see it, it didn't happen. I see there's a generator. I see there's a vehicle. I see McCain out of your accounts. I didn't see how you bought it. Sorry, didn't exist. Okay? It exists, but I, I can't justify it, and you can't justify it to me. So please keep adequate records. Okay, just briefly here, which rules? How are we doing, Melissa, on time? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm loving your questions, but I'm cognizant that we're supposed to be finished in how many minutes here? In about 25 to 30 minutes, yeah. Cool. Okay, I'm going to rush through this, but basically, you know, as I said, different rules apply to different U.S.-based or non-U.S.-based organizations. So the FHIs of the world, I'm just using you guys as an example because I've worked with you and know you pretty well. Basically, a U.S. prime gets the full uniform guidance, okay, and the U.S. standard provision. It's not the light version. Okay, so the U.S. and CDC, there's no light version for CDC at all. Everyone applies the full uniform guidance for all these guys. Now, if USAID or if FHI is going to pass down to a Tanzanian or a, a Mozambican or whatever sub, uh, you pass down the, the sub version, the non-US version. Okay, so almost all of you are probably operating under these light rules that I talked about. What's what applies to you? It's what your award says. Read your award, seventh time. Your award is going to say, we will reimburse you for costs incurred as per the award and the cost principles. That's standard provision number one. Well, let's look at the other one. This is probably more likely now. So USAID funds a Ugandan or a Mauritian or whatever, a, a, a Myanmar prime. So they're automatically passing down to you your award and your non-US provisions. And then you have to pass the same thing down to your subs. All right, so most of us are in this situation where a foreign or non-US prime, non-US sub, that's what localization is. It's getting to grips with all these rules here. Okay, I'm just going to finish this and come back to any final Q&A. So here's the package that you put together. That's what we are going to audit, or this is what an audit package is. It has a schedule of expenditure, a federal award known as a CIFA, formerly known as a FAS, Fund Accountability Statement. That's an income statement. Okay, there's no assets, there's no balance sheet, there's no cash flow statement. It's simply a Schedule of expenditure that I'm going to show you now. Then we give you a report on your internal controls, meaning did you comply with all those 351 items? Now, of course, I said we're only looking at the important ones, but in theory, you should be applying 
or you should be complying with all of these uh, documents and your award. Okay, and then again, internal controls and terms and conditions, that's what we're doing. In year one, the auditor probably will find uh, issues and make recommendations. And for every year thereafter, it's important that the audit report incorporates whether you fixed the stuff that was found last year. Okay, let's not worry about these other ones now. Okay, so here's what a classic FAS or SEPA would look like. Okay, a FAS and SEPA basically is the current fiscal year. So what's your budget and what's your actual? Okay, so again, your job client is to prepare your own SEPA. Under the current and under the current yellow book guidelines, we are not supposed to help you. Now, about a month ago, we had an open training course. We had, what did we have? We had we had 17 audit firms from 19 different countries. The okay, USAID's you know, widening their audit base. So we had a couple of big four who were, who were of course, uh, you know, in, in most countries, but we had uh, we had a number of firms. I asked all the audit firms, just like now, anonymously, I asked, please put your hand up. I knew exactly how many audit firms were there. I said, okay, audit firms, do, do you have any clients who can, do you have, do you have, do you have clients who could not prepare their own CIFA? And you know what I got? A hundred percent feedback, yes. That doesn't mean every client can't prepare their own CIFA. It means every auditor has a client that cannot do it. Okay, this is a big problem. We don't have time to talk about this, but auditors, if you can't, it's not recipients, if you can't prepare your own CIFA, hire a different local audit firm to help you with it. Okay, we had a, I, I, we had a, a guy today call me, he's a CFO of an organization, and he says, Doug, we need some help. I say, great, you know, I, we know, I know, because we work with all the firms. You guys have trouble preparing your, your schedule of expenditure. Yes. Well, hire another firm to do it. Because if you don't, you're burdening your current audit firm with that. And that's unfair, right? Because we we have to, you, you recipients have to prepare this in theory before we start auditing you. These are your numbers. You're responsible. So if you can't do it, hire another firm. Okay, The firm that audits you can't do this because then that's independence uh, impairment. Okay, so just hire another firm to help you prepare your CEPA. So it's the budget and the actual costs that you incur during the year. That's what a CEPA is. Then we are likely going to have what's called question costs. This is what we auditors do. And I'm going to show you what a, the last slide is going to be, what a finding is. A finding is where we find and have question costs You'll see over here, question cost is either ineligible, meaning not allowed, that's the old red card, okay? Or unsupported, which is sort of more a yellow card, which could turn into a red card after year two, okay? That's what you're trying to avoid. You don't want any of these, you want this. You want the green card, okay? So let's let's make sure that you prepare your own CIFA and we auditors will have a much better job sort of pass, helping you pass your audit. Okay, the whole point here, I just want to mention in the current USA guidelines, they sort of unfortunately, I won't say made a mistake because they'll never call it a mistake, but they gave an example, which is a cumulative CIFA. Okay, now that's a problem for many, many reasons. So all I'm saying to you is your CIFA needs to be your current, your current fiscal year and your current actual expenditures. Okay, they go on to show another example that no, they highlight no cumulative amounts because it's actually wrong. Okay, for, for me, not wrong. It's just not a good idea to have a cumulative amounts because you know if you change audit firms, we're not going to provide an opinion on someone else's work. But the whole point is I need to see a budget for each award and an actual for each award. Then the auditors are going to look at this, perform our audit, then we'll probably question your costs as either ineligible or unsupported. And we'll provide notes to the to the reader, who effectively is the agreement officer. Okay, so here I just show the the fully blown up version of you, the recipient, in green. And this is, of course, it's just theoretical. But we've got our top leadership who probably doesn't get that much involved in the audit. Then we've got our probably our senior finance person here, described as the finance director, but she or he could be called anything. And then they've got their helpers, and then of course the staff at the bottom. And then a classic audit firm has a partner, and I was one for 26 years, so we understand something about being partners. Now 35 by now, 32 actually. Um, then a managers who work under us, and then, then our seniors, if you will, and then the staff. 
Okay. Now, the most important thing I want to say to you, IPs, right? The most important that you are, the most important person you are going to deal with is the manager. Okay. She or he needs to be, they'll be the point person for the audit firm. Now, the partner may take responsibility ultimately. Okay. But he or she doesn't do the work. This guy, the manager and her or his senior are the ones who uh, do the most, most of the work who are going to talk to you about any question costs and things like that. So when you hire an auditing firm, you want to make sure a couple of things. One, that these people are competent. Okay, Just because USAID has put the firm on your country's list doesn't mean they're competent. It means they passed a, a review process that the firm as a whole is competent, not these people. So you want to see, when you ask for a proposal, you want to see, show me, that these people are actually competent under the yellow book guidelines. Show me that this manager has done a yellow audit, yellow book audit before. And then I would ask for references from other NGOs, probably in your country. Did you have this person? Was she or he competent? Do you have any concerns with them? Because most of the time when I've seen, and I've seen it, and I'm not going to say which country or which firm, but I, there was one audit firm, big four firm, did bad work. That client, our client, paid over a million dollars. They had, they had, they didn't get reimbursed for a million dollars because of bad auditing. It was turnover at the manager level, turnover at the senior level. It was a disaster. But unfortunately, the mission let it go through. The inspector general let it go through. Why? Because they were on the list. That's the wrong reason. Okay. So make sure the firm is going to be able to deliver for you and the people, not just the firm, the people. Check the manager. Is she competent? Has she done it before? I would do an interview. Actually, they you know they may be even the best person, but if you don't get along with them, you're you're asking for trouble. Okay, so finally in this section, I'm going to talk about what is an audit finding. A finding has what's called uh, four elements: criteria, condition, cause, effect, and then we'll make a recommendation. That's what goes into basically uh, we'll question costs and make recommendations to you, and then you have to sexually uh, comment on our findings to you. Okay, now criteria is what rule was broken. We have to be able to point out in your award or in the provisions, there was a rule in your award. Remember the Bob Strauss four corners rule. If the, if the rule isn't in the award, it doesn't apply to you. Read your award for the eighth time. And again, if your auditor starts saying you broke a rule, you say what rule? Show me, show me in my award what rule I broke. They say, oh, good governance, wrong. That's not a criteria. Best practice, not a criteria. And the rig, we train, we train auditors and, and we work with the rig to say, what upset you about the auditors? And they say this, they say they don't have a criteria. They don't have a reason for questioning the cost. Okay, so you need to make sure for an auditor to find fault with you, it's gotta be in your award. Next is the condition. And that's just where the auditor describes the instance that happened where you broke the rule. So classically, most, most findings have to do with, with bad timekeeping or bad procurement. Okay, so we say, great, the organization had a, you know, maybe it was a, a Kampala-based organization, but they had an operation in Entebbe or in, in uh, you know, wherever else in the, in, in, uh, in the, the, the country. And at that site, off-site, they didn't keep timesheets. Okay, so here we would say, great, the criteria is cost principle 430 uh, I requires timekeeping. Condition, at Entebbe, 10 people for X number of months who got paid so much money didn't keep timesheets. They broke the rule. Okay, the cause, now this is critical. We auditors cannot prepare a finding without you telling us why it happened, okay? That would be incredibly poor auditing for them to assume why it happened. So go back to here, right? They That manager should be coming over to you and saying, look, we found you didn't do timesheets at the Entebbe practice, why? Okay, and you need to give the answer. And that is what this cause is meant to be, okay? So you need a legitimate answer. You can't be the dog ate my homework or fire or flood or I forgot or mistake. Those are not good answers, right? They've got to be, normally it's a breakdown of internal controls, OK? 
Okay, your policies and procedures, you know, that's what we look. We look at your HR policies. Is timekeeping a requirement? Yes. Okay, that's the rule you broke. So that's the, the cause has to come from you. The effect is the financial implication of that. So let's just go back to this example. You've got salaries, question costs, ineligible. You've got $36,000 of ineligible question costs for salaries. Then you know, that's what, in this case, it would be probably, you know, unsupported. Generally, no timesheets is unsupported. But pay. let's say you pay those guys more than their allowable cost. Maybe they're supposed to get $1,000 a month and you paid them $2,000. Their contract says a thousand. You paid them two. Well, the one thousand overage is in ineligible costs, and that would go into this category. Okay, so I'm going to just stop here and just say, okay, so what's going to happen in this case that I just gave you? And Tebby didn't keep timesheets. We would say, uh, please keep timesheets as per the U.S. government rule and as per your own policies. And we document exactly where that rule is, and then we give you time to normally seven to ten days uh, in the draft report to provide us your comments that we can put into the final report. And generally, you would agree with the audit. Now, you could disagree with them, but then it turns into a fun fight, and then you turn into a dispute, and that could get you know, that could contest it, and that gets, that, gets, that gets very difficult. So all I'm saying is your auditors must be able to get your reason for why something happened, and that's the cause. Now, a good auditor will give as much time. We talk about finding and fixing. And I, I talk about no surprises auditing. A good auditor will never surprise you with the finding that you weren't aware of. Because they should be, when we find stuff as a recipient. So if my staff finds something, they'll take, take it to the senior and say, we think we got something. And she's going to say, what do you think you got? And they're going to say, well, I talked to this guy. And you know, a lot of these will get blown off because the guy didn't know what he was asking or whatever else. But then when the something finally sticks, the senior says, okay, that makes sense. They'll bring it to the manager and she or he's going to say, what do you got? And they're going to say, well, looks like it in Tebby, they weren't doing timesheets. So you're going to say, who did you talk to? And you say, well, we talked to the accounting manager and HR and they say they don't do timesheets. Great. I'm going to say my manager is going to walk across or visit or virtually visit the whoever the FD equivalent saying, look, we think you guys have a problem. Okay. So there's no surprise. Now, maybe she says, they do time. She says, of course they do. Who did you talk to? You talked to the HR guy. She doesn't know. Talk to the accounting guy. She knows. Okay. So there could be a lot of fits and starts. But at the end of the day, a good auditor will never surprise you. You should never see a finding in the draft report that you weren't aware of during the award. Okay. We call it no surprises auditing. So I said earlier, constant communication. My early slides were constant communication, of course, between between the, you know, the, the NGO and USAID or the prime, you want constant communication between your audit manager as well. Okay, Melissa, I know I'm a little bit behind here, but let's go to the Q&A, please. And then I'll, I'll do the green book after that. Go ahead. I, I'm gonna go over, you're, you're welcome to leave anybody, but you're certainly welcome to stay you know, after uh, as long as you want. Carry on, thank you. Sure, we have a, a few questions about um, FAA. So how do we ensure reasonableness of the FAA costs if we do not request them from a detailed budget? Okay, so a fixed amount award, there's a process for fixed amount awards and sub awards. I'm assuming this is probably coming from a prime for a sub, fixed amount sub award. Uh, so what there is in the USAID guidelines, it is called uh, ADS 303, I think it's S-A, either S-A-J or S-A-M, okay? ADS 303 S-A, I think it's J. And there's a process in our digital packs. And again, if you at the end of this, take my email and let me just see if I've got that. I'll put it up now. Okay, I'll put it up at the end of the other one. Uh, but the bottom line is we say there's a digital pack and I'll send you the whole pack. There's four documents for when an S-A, a fixed amount award or sub-award is relevant and how to consider preparing the budget and how to negotiate it. So although cost principles are conceptually, you know, uh, considered, meaning, you know, what you basically you're trying to identify what cost sub are you going to have to incur to do these exercises, to deliver these milestones, right? And then you agree on those and then that's it. So cost principles should be considered, but what I'm saying is, you know, they're, because it's not audited, then they really, you, you can't later on say, okay, well, show me that you incurred those costs. That's not what it's about. It's all done up front. Okay, next question.
Next question, Melissa. I think you might be on mute. Sorry, I was muted. Um, you have mentioned the positive uh, attributes of an FAA. Um, yep. Can are there perhaps um, critical things to look out for when implementing under an FAA? What are perhaps the contrasting factors you should consider? Okay, well, good question. I mean, you need to make sure you know it's 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 these milestones are going to be deliverable, are going to be achievable. I mean, the whole point the the whole point of a fixed amount award or sub award is to reduce administrative burden. That's why they were designed. So it's almost like a, it's almost like a contract. It's almost like great. You're going to deliver me a report every month where you go out and survey 300 people or you know whatever. And so it could take you know that's a good example. You're going to send out whatever 20 uh, participant or uh, 20 uh, you know junior guys, not employees, right? This it's a, it's a, a normally well. I don't want to get too deep, but let's just say great. We need to perform X hundred reviews or questionnaires each month. And we're going to collate them and deliver a report. Okay. Well, got to got to be able to deliver. So that's why I say all the work is done up front when creating this fixed amount award or sub award. So there's a whole process you go through, and that is, as I said, ADS 303. I think it's S A S A J or S A M. Uh, and again, I'll I'll show you my email later, and anyone who wants it, I'll send you the whole digital pack. Rose, our global coordinator, will send these to you. Thank you. Next question. Um, sure. Wait, it just spirit me. Here it is. Um, there's a um, couple of questions about um, sub grantees. Um, what determines the classification as a sub grantee? Um, and what does what would an FAA look like for a sub grantee? Okay, well, you wouldn't be a sub grantee or an FAA, it would be one or the other, a fixed amount sub award or a, a sub awardee, right? Fixed amount sub award is an FAA effectively. Okay, so um, so a sub a, a sub awardee is under a prime award. A prime award is a sub award. Now that sub awardee would be doing some work that is the purpose of the program. So, for example, some of you I know are in the HIV space, and you may be a prime, and you may be doing care and treatment, but someone else is doing the male circumcision. Someone else is doing the testing. So we've got an NGO, maybe here in South Africa, we've got a great, it used to be called CHAPS, which is now part of Orem, and they are great at doing male circumcisions. So you may have an overarching HIV program, but a sub-awardee is doing one specific component of that. Okay, that would be an example where you have a sub-awardee. They're doing something specific. Maybe it's geographic. Maybe it's, again, I, 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 that would normally what it would be. So part of, you know, maybe a certain province or state or region of the country gets done by one part of the organization, maybe not the prime. Okay, but the whole point is they're doing some programmatic part of the of the of the project. Good question. Okay. The next, next kind of, the next combines both of those topics, FAAs and sub awards. It, if you are um if you have not been a recipient of an FAA, can you not go ahead and be a sub award? partner with a prime or do you have to have one sure. or the other can you switch yeah yeah it would be one or the other generally uh you can switch nothing stopping you i mean normally again because a fixed amount sub award is is less administrative you normally probably start with that uh and then they'd get trust in the organization then they'd probably bump them up to a, a sub awardee so yes there's no you know no limit on how many on how many years on any classification the whole point is administrative, reducing administrative burden. Good question. I have a few questions here on audits. So um, for organizations, for sub-awardees sub with less than $250,000 that don't require audit by USAID, can that sub include audit fees in its budget for a local audit? Uh, read that again, please. Sure. So for subs with less than two and with a budget of less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That... Well, okay. That first of all, it would be seven fifty, right? Maybe they mean seven fifty. Mm -hmm. sure. Because see, see, let me just say three. The CDC level is three hundred right now. The U.S. AIDS is seven fifty. So I'm I'm going to read that as for subs with less than seven fifty. Okay, that doesn't require an audit. Then go ahead. Um. 
that doesn't require an audit, can that sub include an audit fee in its budget for a local audit? Okay, so it gets a good question. There's two different types of audits. There is what we call the statutory audit or the audit for your country and the USAID yellow book audit, audit performed in accordance with generally accepted government auditing standards. Okay, that organization, that NGO under 750 expending in their fiscal year doesn't require and you shouldn't have the yellow book audit. Okay, USAID's not gonna pay for it, but they can have their own statutory audit. And remember, in most countries, you must have a statutory audit to be in business. So there's a perfect example of where USAID would uh, pick up its fair share of the organization's statutory audit. The local Mozambican, Myanmar, you know, uh, whatever, Ethiopian audit, not the USAID audit. Yes, absolutely. USAID will pick up its fair share. Good question. Great. Um, do organizations spending um, less than $1 million in one year, but cumulatively, oh, excuse me, I misread the question. Do organizations spending um, less than $1 million on maybe one individual project, but cumulatively across all projects, more than a million dollars in a year qualify for a federal audit? Yes. Yeah. You put together, it gets a bit complicated, but assume from USAID's purpose, if you've got uh, two projects that each spend 500 Together, it's over 750. They get the audit. Absolutely. So if USAID, you know, if USAID only gave 500 and CDC gave 250, that's cumulatively 750. Well, you're under the CDC threshold of 300, and you're under the USAID threshold of 750. Even though cumulatively they are 750, I would we would suggest to our clients go to CDC and USAID independently saying, look, you gave us, you gave us for USAID, you gave us 500. We also had uh, a 250 from CDC, that equals 750. Do you want the audit? They're going to say no. CDC would say the same thing. We gave you 250. We don't care about USAID giving you 500. You wouldn't get the audit. Okay. We would tend to audit. You could, we would audit that. If, let's, let's say they had a million dollars of USAID money and 500 of CDC money. So it's over both thresholds. We would audit them separately, but we would, we sorry, we would we would audit them together at the same time. We would report separately. USAID wants and gets their own audit of their funds. CDC wants and gets their own audit report of their funds. And okay? that can get fairly complicated. And certainly, feel free to ask me questions anytime on how to deal with with uh, with multiple funders. Great. Two more questions, and we got to get into our green book. Sure. There's um, a couple of questions here about um, the de minimis and perhaps misuse of the de minimis. So if I, if a okay. financial director finds a complete misuse of the de minimis, um, should he do something about that? Where do you report it? What what would you do in that case? Well, it's pretty hard to have a misuse of the de minimis because there's no definition on how you're supposed to spend it. Okay. There is none. And if you go to, and where you find this exactly is 2 CFR 200, 414 subpart F, third sentence. Okay. It says there is no requirement. There's no just, there's no requirement to justify the use of the 10% dimensions. Okay. Now, you know, but then the next sentence, the fourth sentence goes on to say, right? A, you must not double bill or inconsistently uh, bill direct and indirect costs. So that's the gray area. It's not audited very clearly. It's in the preamble to the unit. Again, I can't go. I can't go to all these slides because we, we don't have time. But this isn't the indirect cost course. Okay, but it's very clear. The de minimis is not audited, and you do not have to justify. It. And that 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 COFAR Council on Financial Assistance Reform. If anyone wants it, I'll give you my email at the end of the next uh, the next presentation. Uh, I'll send it to you. But it makes it very clear. COFAR says right. They cannot demand that you explain how you use it. So it is a gray area. As an auditor and a taxpayer, yeah, I'm a bit worried about it. But the whole point is 10%. That's why they call it de minimis, right? The legal term de minimis says that for which the law does not care. It's a legal term. That for which the law does not care, meaning it's too small for the law to apply, meaning the NICRA law, the auditing law, those sort of things. I'll have to leave that at that because uh, I, I get, get going on indirect costs in, in, in uh, de minimis and we'll never get through this. Okay, 
Another last question then. If there's any time at the end, I'll answer all the questions, any remaining ones at the very end. Okay. Sure. Yeah, there's there's several questions here, but um let me find one. Um when you were going through uh an example of, of an audit criteria that might have been broken, what how right. many or to what extent does that criteria need to be broken in order for it to be considered um an issue? Okay, good, very good question. So a couple of points. A criteria could be, it, it, you, you broke a rule. The important thing to know here is which rule did you break? Now you could break a US government rule or you could break your own rule. And from an auditing point of view in a US government rule, there's no sort of severity of which rule did you break. They're both equally bad. So you could, so in, in our example, I talked about timesheets. So in the cost principles, 2 CFR 200, 430, subpart I, there are many things that you must do to document your time. Okay, so I'm going to look for that. You didn't have this, you didn't have that, your timesheets didn't include all the person's time, your whatever. I'll, I'll find a specific thing that you broke. Or what's your own policy, the organization's own policy on timekeeping? And again, it will say, well, you buy the X of the month, the fifth of the month or whatever, you must do timesheets or whatever else, or what must be included in a timesheet. Uh, and if you didn't, if you broke your own rule, then that is the criteria. Okay, the condition, again, is just what we found. That condition has to be descriptive enough so the reader, the interpreter, normally the agreement officer, she or he's going to make the decision. Am I going to allow this cost or disallow it? They can sit there in their desk here in Washington and read it and say, ah, I understand what happened. This auditor has explained the problem. You know, eight people in Entebbe at a sub a sub project didn't keep timesheets for the whole year. And they each made whatever, you know, $2,000 a month. So I can calculate and I can understand in my mind what happened. That's it. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. So that is what the breakdown is. That's the criteria is which rule was broken specific to your award or the cost principles or your own principles. Thank you. Final question, I'm gonna move on. Sure. Um, final qu question, um, can you give an example in an, uh, in an audit of um, condition, cause and effect? I, just perhaps one more time. Yeah, okay, so let's just take salary as we just said. So someone's salary, uh, so the criteria is, well, okay, salary could be, I mean, the whole point of a person's con it could be two things here. A person's contract was uh, that he or she gets $2,000 a month. I know many of us work in Quatcha, shillings, whatever, uh, in Langini, you know, whatever. Let's just turn it into dollars. So the person's contract says he or she gets $2,000 a month. That's the criteria. The condition is we saw that that guy was paid $2,200 a month. Okay. And for, for 12 months, employee X was paid $2,000. So criteria? Employee, and so the criteria, basically the rule that was broken is the contract was broken, or we're going to say, um, you know, for for, uh, for reasonableness, and that, that could be another thing to get into. The reasonableness of someone's salary could be into question. But if the contract says two thousand bucks, the salary is the salary. So the condition, as we say, for twelve months, of employee X, you never put people's names in any reports, but employee X or employee number X uh, was paid. 2,200 a month. Okay, the cause has to come from you. So we'll, auditors will go to you and say, FD, the contract with this guy says 2,000 and you gave him or her 2,200. Why? Okay, it could be oversight. It could be, well, they were really working or we forgot to give them a raise last year or they're highly rated or they speak Zulu or, you know, what, but, you know, I don't care, right? From an auditor's point of view, you can explain to me why you paid them that, but the contract was 2,000. Okay, so the condition was, uh, sorry, the, the criteria was the contract said 2000, condition you paid 22, the cause you've explained it to me, but you know the effect is 12 months times 200, so $2,400 will be questioned as probably ineligible. It's, in, it's not unsupported, right? The, I, we saw the timesheet and the guy worked the time, he or she just got paid too much. So that will be deemed an ineligible cost. And then I'm going to recommend that USAID make the determination. We don't say anything to USAID. We don't tell USAID what to do. 
we we leave it out there. USAID is going to have to make the determination of whether that cost will be demanded to be paid back or or they'll let you get away with it. Okay. They'll say next time, please modify if if your if your cause was good, like really we should have fixed it, but we forgot, or the finance manager didn't do the raises this year, or you know, we told them they're getting raises, but it wasn't in their contracts. What a what a if, if you create a good enough story, they may allow you to get away with it. Okay, but that would be your management comments here. Our recommendation is going to be fix the problem. It would be pay the people what your contract says they deserve. Okay, there could be a lot more. You know, that's just an example. I'll leave it at that. That was that's a classic example of a finding. Okay, let me get on to the other. Um, let me do the new share. Go to the green book. Okay, now this is going to be. Uh, it's going to have to be quick because I, I see we're at time but I do want to at least get through this. Okay, so let's go, it's a new share. I think I'm sharing this one. Am I sharing you the green book? Yes, looks yes. great. Cool, okay, let's get it into slideshow. Okay, it's known as the green book, okay? And the whole point, the green book's quite old. It's been in existence since 1983. And the whole point of the green book is that, um, uh, it's just a, the internal control process of the U.S. government. It piggybacks on other guidelines, which is known as the COSO framework, okay, which is the private sector. Down here, the COSO framework is the private sector structure for an internal control framework, okay? So the U.S. government's just literally piggybacking off of the private sector, which is fine. No one cares because it's a global standard, Okay. Now, basically, where is this? For USAID, it's at 2 CFR 200-303. For 45 CFR 75, it's at 75-303 as well. And the whole point is it just says every entity must have a system of internal controls. So again, one more time, that's what you're direct costing your internal control framework. If we were to do a risk review for you, that is getting your, or any auditor in your country wants to do a risk review, that is an allowable cost to get your structure in place, right? So get proper internal controls and charge for it, okay? 90% of the reason why IPs win your award is because the technical side, not the cost side. USA, it's not trying to nickel and dime you, right? Determine what you're going to need to successfully implement the program and recover those fees. Okay, so the entity must, notice this must, must have a system of internal controls. Then it goes on to say these controls should be in compliance with this green book or internal control framework. Then it goes on to say internal controls have to make sure you comply with the statutes and regulations, meaning your award. Okay, we are going to evaluate your compliance with your award and your standard provisions. We want to make sure that you've taken action when the auditors find problems. And then finally, make sure you protect your personal information, your, your, your data on people and names and bank accounts and cell phone numbers and what they're doing on the project. Okay, there's a lot of stuff projects do that are very sensitive, right? HIV AIDS is still a is still deemed to be a uh, you know problem in many countries. Uh, many US government pro democracy and governance, pretty sensitive information, maybe certain types of uh, gay, lesbian voting rights, all these sort of social topics could be very sensitive in many countries. So please make sure any information about your participants is highly, highly, highly secure and, and, and guarded. Okay, so the overview of a system of internal controls is the systems takes you through identifying your objectives, which what are most of your objectives are what you're going to do in your award. 10,000 people on care and treatment. Okay, so you'll design, you'll identify what you're doing, you'll design your controls to put in place to achieve your goals, and the controls are in place and operating, and then you will probably achieve your objectives. Okay, but that's a big fat maybe, possibly. Not always. Okay, why? Well, look at this guy here. Okay, does this guy look happy to you? Anyone who has thinks he's happy, send me an emoji. Send me a happy emoji. Okay, anyone. Now, he does not look happy. Why is he not happy? Does anyone know who this guy is? Anyone think you know? Raise your hand if you think you know who he is. Okay, no one. Okay, that guy's Nick Leeson. Does anyone know who Nick Leeson was? 
Okay, Nick Leeson was the original rogue trader. Okay. If your money was in this bank in the UK, do you think it would be safe? Okay. I mean, it's, you know, the, the safe is like, you know, those Mission Impossible safes down in the basement, three levels deep with the big silver doors locked up every night. If your money was there, I think it would be safe. Well, it wasn't. That was Bearings Bank. Nick Leeson was the original rogue trader. Nick Leeson basically went to prison for six and a half years because he lost over $1.4 billion of money okay, by rogue trading. Okay, So he went to jail. Why? Because he there was no internal controls over what Nick did. So it didn't matter that it was Bearings Bank and the Queen had her money in there and Harry and everyone had their money in there. It didn't matter. They all lost. Okay, because there was no internal, there wasn't any controls over what this guy was doing. Okay, so I don't, we don't have a lot of time to talk about it. Just the concept of internal controls. If we were talking about fraud and that internal controls are all one of the five most hot topics that we talk about on, on day three of our training. But the bottom line here, this survey has actually never been updated that I'm aware of. But the whole point is 59% of fraud happens because there were per internal controls. Okay, there was an opportunity to commit fraud. And this can be managed by having proper internal controls. Okay, so if you don't have internal controls or a risk register yet, hire local, or you can't hire your auditing firm, but you can hire another firm in your country or anywhere to do a risk assessment for you. And I'll briefly talk about that. But internal controls are managed by the board, by management, and by the personnel, the staff. It takes all of them working together. Okay, so here is what this cube looks like. It's called the COSO framework. It looks like a rubrics cube. And the whole point across the front is called the five components of control. Across the top are the operate are the categories of your objectives. So your operations, your reporting, and your compliance. And that's what we test as well. Well, we don't test your operations. That's you satisfying USA that you have achieved your goals but we will be auditing your reporting and your compliance. Okay, and then this here level of the organization is, is more theoretical. It's the entity from its largest, meaning the global size down to maybe Pan-Africa, maybe down to your state, and then your functions, okay? So if you think about Bearings Bank, what went wrong with Bearings Bank? Well, Nick Leeson was part of your operations. He was a function, he was treasury. Okay. And what was done, what was what the problem was there was no risk assessment done on, on uh, derivative trading. So it was an operational issue at a functional level. So it was a function, an operational level at the, the no risk assessment and no control activities were done. So if this was a glass cube, you'd be looking back there, you'd go back the function, back to operations, and down here under risk assessment, somewhere in the back of the cube there, those two little squares weren't addressed. That brought the bank down. Didn't matter that the floors were clean and security was good and the people were all nice and they met all the rules and regulations of banking in the UK. Didn't matter, right? Risk assessments weren't performed. Control activities weren't in place. $1.4 billion lost out of business. Okay, so that's what you need to do. Okay, so the control environment, as we said, the control environment takes place at basically at the, at the top of this cube here. The board and management put the set the do the uh, control environment put it in place, and then uh, risk assessment. I'll briefly talk about that's the fun part of internal controls, assessing what could go wrong in our organization, and this takes a, a, a diverse variety of people to work together on that. Okay, and then you put activities in place, all the policies and procedures, and then again information flows through the organization on what basis, what data flows through. That's what's quite important. And of course, you, the system has to monitor itself. Okay, when something goes wrong, we have to figure out what went wrong and fix it. Okay, so that's just more details on what takes place in each of those components. Okay, we don't have time to go through it, but it doesn't matter. Now, I've given you a checklist, or I, I can give you a checklist. And okay, so that was, sorry, those were the five uh, uh, it, it components. Control environment, risk assessment. That's what goes across the front of the queue. Control environment, risk assessment. Then we're talking about now about these categories or objectives. So that's the operations. What are you achieving? 10,000 people in care and treatment. Reporting is what USAID has demanded you get on a quarterly, annual, whatever, monthly basis, your financial reports and so forth. That is your, your objective. 
And then of course your compliance, that's the 350 must that you have to comply with. Okay, that's what we're looking at. And then, as I said, the, the structure of the organization is from its largest global level down to the functions of HR, payroll, whatever else. Uh, each of those has some unique aspect to its square. Okay, I'm just gonna finish up here. A fraud risk register is basically quite a, a, a long thing. Okay, and it's basically, it's it's um, this is what the full thing would look like. Okay, we could share this with you, but I'm gonna break it down into two. And basically it's the process that you go through when you do your risk assessment to identify what can go wrong. And you do it by area, HR, finance, asset management, procurement, all these things. You identify the potential risks and why it may be a risk and what, 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 um, uh, what controls do we have in place. And then what's called the risk, the framework, which you're trying to eventually get to this sort of heat map, if you will, and the concept is, what is the impact of this fraud if it were to happen? And what is the likelihood that it's going to happen? So likelihood could be one through four. It's very likely to happen. And if it did happen, what's the impact? And that's what you're looking at here when you're looking at the risk likelihood and the risk impact. And likelihood times impact gives you your score. Okay, And that score effectively then goes into the, uh, you know, that's where it gets placed on this heat map. Okay. So this is a fun exercise. If you haven't done it, if you don't do it, please do it. If nothing else, you don't have an internal control framework, internal audit team, do this, okay? And the whole point is uh, then what happens is management takes actions and decides what to do and who's gonna do it. And that's what goes into your risk register. And this gets reviewed on a quarterly or semi-annual basis and that your auditors can do it. Like, again, your auditors can't do it, but some auditors in your country could do this. If you, if you don't have guys to do it, We'll do it for you. Okay, uh, internal control health checklist. We've created this, and this is the way that you self-assess your organization. And you'll see here we're starting with the five sort of uh, you know the, the five, if you will, your control environment and so forth. And we have you you self. I'm just going to show you the results. We're going to finish with the results of where we've done this sometimes, just to show you how diverse control internal controls can be. So it's a self-assessment and we've, we've anonymized it. So, you know, no one knows who's asked which questions or what your answers were. But the bottom line is, you know, you take you through a one or two day process and you rate yourself as strong, moderate, weak or non-existent. Okay, so, you know, there's the control environment. There's a number of principles. So just going back to these here, there are, uh, so there's the component and then these are all called the principles. And then within each principles, there's what's called points of presence or specific questions. And so notice here, control environment, demonstrate commitment to integrity. So we go down to the questionnaire and you'll see, you'll see um, uh, control environment, demonstrate commitment to integrity. Then you've got sp some specific questions about that that you have to answer, okay? That will lead to a score. And so again, oversight responsibility is a second principle. The third one is establishing the structure and so forth. And these are all questions you answer and then you will have uh, then you analyze it. And that's what we do in the internal control course. We talk about it and people talk about what they have and what they don't have. And that's why uh, this is a quite exciting course when you mix who's in the, in the course. Okay, we tend to do this, uh, we don't do it virtually because it's it's not really fun or effective when you do it virtually because you need to sit around a table and talk to people. Okay, let me just show you some real life analyses of what happened. Okay, I never say which country, never say which firms, but normally we'd be hosted by one of the big four firms who needs training in their country. As this, that's what happened. We had a big four firm somewhere in Africa. And basically it was NG, it was the, the firm itself uh, and some NGOs. And it was a minute. Now we normally don't talk about ever about who the, who's there, but the guy insisted. He was a, a chief of the minister of health of that country. And he was the green guy. And I said, look, we don't talk about it. He goes, talk about it. I'm not saying the country, but he said, Talk about it. He says, look, because the bottom line is you'll note that I am weak. This green is weak, 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 or non-existent almost for risk assessment and controls. Okay. And he said, look, we don't have the money for it. We don't have the time for it. We're saving lives. So we can't, hey, we don't have the time to perform these risk assessments and responsibilities. We put stuff into place and we operate and, you know, hopefully we will have adequate controls. Okay. That's why there's a lot of fraud in, 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 in at least ministries of health, well, in many ministries, but it's certainly in this ministry of health, you know, huge frauds in, in many of our countries. 
Okay, but so all I'm showing here is you know the different types of ratings and the ratings for normally your your accounting firms because they don't change that often. We audit auditing, tax, consulting, you know maybe corporate finance or something, but we don't change. Whereas UIPs change every five years. Okay, your programs change. What you're willing to do changes. Under COVID, things change. You change. Auditing firms don't change. So you're tending to have more weaker, you know, weaker uh, policies and procedures and weaker results. Okay. So the next one was basically real life examples. I every year for many years before COVID, I would go to Washington and train a consortium of universities in global health. Okay unnamed, but every big name you know of a university or a health organization across Europe or across the States was there. Now this floored me, okay? These are the best, or in in, in this period, there, there, Ebola was present, right? And the guys who were managing Ebola, there were two universities managing Ebola in the States at the time. And remember those universities and health are super, right? They've got the guys in the spacesuits, you know, sorting out Ebola. Look how they rated themselves. And I can't go through the ratings individually, but look at other than the leaders of the organization saying that generally they had some fairly strong, you know, controls up front and tone at the top is good. Look how they rated themselves. Weak, 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 weak. How can this be? How can the best organizations be weak? Okay, that means you need other processes in place. You need fraud control in place. You need inventory control in place. You need policies and procedures in place. OK, but they don't they're not doing risk assessments and they had no reason to lie to me. I mean, this was totally anonymous anyways. But the bottom line is, you know, big or you know, there's no auditing firms here. Okay? This was all universities and, and institutions in global health. Basically, they're incredibly weak. OK, next, we had a situation where was where was this? OK, this was up between Pretoria and Joburg. And there's a midsize firm up there that uh, these this is about the time all these auditing firms needed to get caught up on their continuing education, which we do. So this is basically big four and mid-tier auditing firms, a couple NGOs, basically auditing firms. Look at that. Firms versus educational institutions, health sector, right? Weak, 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 weak. Auditing firms, strong, 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 or, you know, moderate. Okay. A lot of lessons here. Okay. And that's, I'm going to leave it at that because it's time. But all I want to say, you guys, internal controls are incredibly important. And to me, internal controls are a life skill. So take our, take our number down there if you want any of the stuff I've been talking about or to understand more about the training sessions we have. But um, yeah, this one will be stuck there on the IntraHealth uh, website for some time. But the bottom line about internal controls is that they're a life skill. And once you learn internal controls, you can't forget them, okay? A life skill, like you cannot forget how to tie your shoe. You cannot forget how to read, right? Unless you have a, unless you have a, you know, a head trauma. Once you learn how to read, you can read. Once you learn how to ride a bike, you really never forget it. You might get rusty. Once you learn how to drive an, a stick shift, right? Again, once you learn how to swim, these are skills that once you learn them, you don't forget. Internal controls are the same thing in your organizations. You learn internal, that's why for auditors, the biggest benefit of an audit you know, junior is they go around in different audit organizations and they just like a sponge, they soak up structure, 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 what's working, what's not working, and that sticks with you for life. So when I'm talking about those risk assessments and, and performing them, if you guys aren't doing them, please you know get do that if you do nothing else and work with your, your internal audit organization or, or outsource internal audit, you can do that. Most firms that we, we we train, they say they would do outsourced internal audit, meaning they can't audit you and do internal audit, but they could serve as your sort of contract internal auditors. And you want to be a part of that. You think that's dull and boring. I promise you, it's not dull and boring. It's very essential. And even if you're not, if, you know, you're, you're probably not going to be in your organization for the rest of your life. You might, you know, move to another organization. You might create your own. You might join a family business. You might do a lot of different things, but everything you learn on internal control sticks. Okay, Melissa, let's thank you, Melissa, for what you've done. And I know some people want to get off. I see we've had a couple of drop-offs already, but any final questions we'll address now. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Um, we have uh, several questions here. Um, 
since we moved it really fast, can you explain the difference between the green book and the yellow book? Sure. The green book, the yellow book, they're both, first of all, they're both put out by the, uh, I think I have one here. Do I have it here? Yeah, the green book. So I don't have the, I don't have a green screen. The green book is put out by the GAO, Government Accountability Office. That's the internal control framework. Okay, that's referred to for USAID as eight as, as two CFR 200, 303. You must comply with, you must have in controls. They should comply with the green book. The yellow book is generally accepted government auditing standards. That's the standards by which we auditors will perform your USAID or CDC audit. They're totally different documents. Both of them are available at www.gao.gov. Okay, good question. Next. Next question is who in the organization must take responsibility for the internal control framework? Whose job is that? Yo, okay. I guess it depends on how big of an organization it is. Uh, if you're a large organization, it would be, well, some organizations have an internal audit function. Okay, it's just a whole big function. And again, if you're probably uh, an NGO for, for you know many years and have multiple awards, multiple donors, you should have some sort of internal audit function. I would say it probably relies, or it, it probably rests somewhere under the finance function. Although internal audit reports to the board, and the CEO, okay, they, they meant to go straight to the, they do go straight to the board. They report straight line to the board, a dotted line to the CEO. And again, depending on what the, the issues are, internal audit reports to either the board or the, the, the CEO. But they're probably under the finance function because it's mainly about policies and procedures and that kind of stuff. So if it doesn't belong under HR or operations. It's more of a finance function. Good question. Is a risk register or risk map um, a format, a, a requirement? Do you have to do that in order to start? Uh, no, but you must have a system of internal control. So if we think about, let's just, uh, I'm going to take off anyone you, uh, I'll come back to the slide, but let me just zip back to where we were. Let's go back to uh, the musts, right? Going back here, starting with an organization must have a system of internal controls here then that control should be in compliance with this green book, okay? So then it goes on to say, so the risk register is basically uh, this section here. Let me go down to the uh, control environment, risk assessment. So that's here. So that's the second component of it. And so in there, the risk assessment here, this is the second, I know I'm, I'm zipping through these. The risk assessment says, what do we do? We define what are our objectives and risk tolerances. So if our objectives are uh, 10,000 people on care and treatment, okay, the risk section says, well, if we're not meeting that, when do the alarm bells go off? Okay, so that's what that risk tolerance is. Then identify, analyze, and respond to risks. So really the risk register is part of, of this uh, risk assessment component here. Okay, so that is what that is. Good question. Next question, please. This is the last question we have. Um, how were the ratings performed in that example that you showed? How were the ratings performed? Okay, so in these we would have, well, uh, strong, okay. You, first of all, you rate yourself as per our checklist here. And again, I'm happy to send this to you guys. We've we've modified this. This was created long, not long, well, long ago, actually. It was more private sector focused. So we said, look, this doesn't work for our NGO clients. So we've sort of modified it a bit. It's the same, same structure, but we've modified the sort of questions for more of an NGO environment, okay? But basically you assess yourself as strong, moderate, or weak. I mean, you could put these into numbers, but the bottom line is, you know, this by rating yourself. And, and you know, and, and a lot of people think, and this is, you know, people talk about a NUPIS, a pre-award survey versus an OCA an organizational assessment, okay? And an OCA is performed by on yourself by yourself, whereas a NUPIS is performed by someone else. A pre-award survey is done by USAID or an audit firm. So here, this assessment could be done, you know, that's what we had people self-assess themselves here. So I think this is, the, this is the key one, right? These are the leaders of these leading global institutions rating themselves as weak. 
Okay, so that's, I mean, all they, they rated themselves. All we did was document their ratings. So, I mean, you don't need an exact 3.5 or a, you know, we're here in the ones or twos or threes. The whole point is you could get very specific. And I guess the, the whole point of an organization, when they're doing their own risk assessment, when they're doing their own checklist, this is the thing you would use to help your, uh, to help identify your, your potential risks. Okay, your risk assessment. We're doing a risk assessment down here. Uh, we don't have an organizational structure. Okay, well, what's the risk of that? Well, we're not going to be compliant, certainly from a control point of view. Uh, you know, we may not pass our pre-award survey and those kind of things. I mean, it, it, again, this is a it's a it's a two day course. I can't give it all in in five minutes. I'd love to, but uh, yeah, it's a process. It's an exciting process. A lot of people think that's the last thing I'd want to do. I think it's one of the first things you'd want to do: participate in a risk assessment. Okay, is that it, Melissa? Yep, that's the end of the questions. Okay, well, guys, again, I want to thank Melissa for all you've done to enable us to uh, to uh, to you for moderating and, and and keeping us on the straight and narrow, and of course, IntraHealth, your your associates there. And then finally, of course, all you participants for participating and the great questions you asked. And then of course, uh, USAID for paying for all this. So as Melissa said, uh, this this web webinar and others are going to be up on their site. Maybe give us that URL. Yeah, did you put that in uh, in the WhatsApp a couple of times or in the- Did in put the... it in the chat a couple of times. I'm gonna um, okay. put it again. I know um, there were a few of you that were having some issues with the link. So um, I'll go ahead and email these. We don't normally do this, but um, because some of you have expressed some issues with this link, um, it's likely a local issue with your network, but um, we can send them via email. So I will do that um, for this particular webinar. Um, but perhaps on a different day, if your network is, is better, um, you can check back at that resource page for other resources um, that are available to all of you to use. Yeah, great. Thanks, Melissa. And again, one more time, if you didn't get that uh, that, that guideline that I recommended, Bob Strauss, it's Strauss, S-T-R-O-S-S, -S, at one word, Robert Strauss Chartered dot net. Okay. We get there, you, know, you pay some money for it, but it's the best guideline in the world. Uh, I would be lost without that guidance. Okay. And again, anything, any questions or whatever, please feel free to send them to us. And we'll try to, I mean, I couldn't answer all your questions, but you know, we'll try to follow up. And and again, thanks to USAID for enabling that. Hey, Melissa, I think you're in control. So uh, uh, let's all have a great day. And I know it's quite late over in the Far East. So please go to bed. Okay. And we'll see you. That's it actually for this series, isn't it? I think yes. this is the last one mm -hmm. I'm doing. And I just want to thank again, ASAP for giving me over the three years opportunity to do dozens of these webinars uh, to share what I can with you. Thank you, Melissa. So appreciate Doug for doing um, all of these webinars. Again, if uh, there are many um, topics that are listed on the website, so please go ahead and, and go back through those, um, as well as look out for news on upcoming webinars. Again, there's a one French one next week um, and several in planning. So make sure you're on our newsletter to hear about those. Um, and thank you, Doug, so much for your dedication to our project and for so many excellent webinars. Um, uh -huh. It's been truly a great resource for all local partners. So thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Bye.